such as the comprehensive plan, zoning ordinance amendments, planning and zoning ordinance amendments, Planning Commission actions are in the form of recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners, the final decision makers. All Planning Commission meetings are open to the public and community members are welcome to observe all Planning Commission briefings and work sessions. Public comment is allowed on those topics for which a public hearing has not been held. My name is Derek Day and I reside in District 1 and we will go ahead and continue our introductions in the boardroom and then we'll pass it off to Sandy online. We'll start with you, Commissioner Fittenberg. Bill Fishburn, District 4. Scott Nelson, District 4. Colin Bartlett, District 5. Mary Halverson, District 2. Daniel Bumbarker, District 1. Eric Casino, uh, I have serve at large, but live in the Lacey UGA. Oh, all right. And Commissioner Kaiser. Sandy Kaiser, living and serving District 3. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on, um, I would accept a motion to approve the agenda. So move. <laughs> You want to convert one of those to a second? Second. Yeah. <laughs> you can get easy for the mistake. We'll see if you can keep it up all night. Punish <laughs> Polly. <laughs> all right. Uh, the motion is moved and seconded. Um, any discussion about the agenda or any amendments? All right. Um, all in favor of approving the agenda? Uh, I move to approve the agenda for <laughs> 21 August 2024. Okay, and we'll also take a roll call vote now okay. for the approval. So we're in a motion, then seconded. <laughs> okay. Did I miss it? So, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor of approving the agenda for tonight? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. Um, we'll move on to meeting minutes. Have folks had a chance to take a look at those? We did not provide meeting minutes at this time. We are still in the process of developing them from the last meeting, so they will be delayed okay. until further notice. Um, but the audio record when still stands is the official meeting. Okay. So we're going to touch on nobody approving the meeting minutes that do not exist. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to approve the recording as the official record. And I would accept a motion to do so. Um, well, I wasn't here, so <laughs> it would be a little weird if I'm the one mo moving. I'm. All right. Um, do I hear a motion to accept the audio as the official meeting record? I want to see the written. You want to see the written? I haven't I haven't actually looked at the audio version, so I can't verify it's fine. Yeah, so I don't know if I'm interested. All right. We can hold off on that one. I don't we're in a particular hurry. So we can move on to our public communications. So we'll um for those of you online, go ahead and raise your hand if you're interested. Um, but the Thurston County Planning Commission welcomes comments from the public at all public at all meetings. Um, our general speaking guidelines are to please introduce yourself, including your address, where you reside in the county. Um, please also address the Planning Commission, not the audience or staff. Uh, the Planning Commission does not respond to public comments. Um, and speakers are limited to a total of three minutes. Uh, you will see a timer. Um, on the video screen that will help keep track of time. And uh, you cannot donate your time to another speaker, another commenter. Um, please no comments that are lewd, offensive, inflammatory, hateful, defamatory, or discriminatory, discriminatory in nature. And please no comments that are commercial in nature. Um, all materials provided to the county may be subject to release pursuant to the Public Records Act. And uh, remarks on projects that have already had a public hearing are not permitted. Um, thank you, please, or thank you for your consideration. And we will go ahead and start off in the boardroom. It looks like we've got three folks who are signed up. Um, and we can start with Rhonda Larson Kramer.
My name is Rhonda Larson Kramer. I live at 1814 East Side Street, Southeast in Olympia. I wanted to follow up on the discussion from last meeting, August 7th, regarding housing in rural areas. I noticed that during the meeting, about 90% of the discussion was concerning ways to add new housing to rural lands. Slide 11 of the PowerPoint from Burke Consulting was the only slide that addressed adding affordable housing to an urban growth area, specifically Grand Mound. I wanted to say that I think the ratio should be reversed. 90% of the discussion should be focused on building affordable housing in small towns and UGAs like Grand Mound. A large part of the discussion concerned cluster housing for affordable homes, but staff mentioned that this land use tool ends up being used very little in the counties that use it. The same issue has been said of ADUs, very few get built. The housing crisis is too big to be spending most of the discussion on tools that don't get used much in the end. Uh, and there are too many constraints to building new housing in rural lands because new housing means sprawl. So let's focus time on coming up with ways to increase housing in small towns. The people who need the housing, who are the victims of redlining, for example, they're gonna directly benefit from housing, focusing on that rather than on cluster housing and ADUs. All the obstacles getting in the way of new housing in rural areas go away when we bend like a reed to the GMA and stop trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The GMA makes it much easier to build in small towns compared to building in rural areas because of the density restrictions. Let's fix the inequities and racial disparities by doing what Loretta Seppinen recommended, that the county can use its planning resources to assist small towns with building affordable as to the fifth wheels in rural areas, I don't know that there's evidence that says that if we build more affordable housing in rural areas, the number of fifth wheels go down. What may happen instead is that cluster housing and ADUs get lived in by upper middle class white people and the number of fifth wheels continues to increase. If instead we focus on increasing low income housing in the small towns and in Grand Mound area, we will increase the housing supply by a lot more. And this will result in the number of fifth wheels going down. So we get a lot more bang for the buck that way. Similarly, I don't know if people living in clusters will share cars. I would want to see the evidence to support that. What I do know is if we build affordable housing in rural towns, we will be putting the housing where the people are sure to have transportation options uh, other than owning their own car. I also want to address the term conservation subdivisions. This is a, what cluster housing was called by Burke on August 7th. Cluster subdivision, uh, conservation subdivision is an oxymoron, I would uh, <laughs> suggest. I get that it's to reduce the footprint overall by clustering homes. And Thank you. Not Unfortunately, it's Zoom, I didn't update and we can't change that. So. <laughs> it's better than beeping, I guess. It feels like you're at the Oscars. And you're over time. All right. Um, next up, we have Mike Brewer, it looks like. Hi, good evening. My name is Mike Brewer. I live at 2228 Wedgwood Drive. I here tonight to speak on housing and encourage the consideration of uh, higher densities. Uh, much like Rhonda said, the, the rural UGA, or excuse me, ADUs, uh, they just simply don't get built with any kind of volume that will help change the, the overall scenario in our, in our community. And so the use of urban growth areas and multifamily housing really is the best path to generate any kind of quantity uh, in in terms of housing units to address the the overall uh, uh, lack of housing. I also want to uh, focus on the fact that that it takes the investment of, of private uh, enterprise to build many of these facilities um, and and the infrastructure, extending utilities and whatnot, and so without the uh, public utilities being at water or sewer, you simply can't get, get the density. And so there are a lot of uh, forthcoming tools that, that may provide more flexibility on, on, uh, on basically getting land that can be served by, by public utilities. So you know, I just want to strongly encourage the, the multifamily and the higher densities 
uh, because that, that truly is the only way we're gonna we're gonna get there. Trying to do these things in rural lands just don't develop the, the quantities necessary to, to make a meaningful impact in our societal societal deficit. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Betsy North. My name is Betsy Norton. I'm uh, from, I live in Olympia. Um, and I'd like to just make remarks on the climate change draft that we have so far. Um, I have some general remarks. Uh, just generally, I, uh, it lacks the necessary urgency and it doesn't have effective um, required actions that need to happen. I have here, I'm gonna share with you guys, for now, there's a, I have some graphs of what's happening with climate change, but the scientists are saying we have the next 20, 10 to 20 years to make an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And after that, sort of everything is done. And so, uh, because there's a lot of lag time between what's happening with global warming and the amount of greenhouse gases that we put into the environment. So the idea that voluntary, you know, what I saw in this plan is basically not much in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of voluntary programs, which are fine. And, you know, rooftop solar is an excellent idea, but we need to really um, double down on renewables, creating renewable energy, but also, um, you know, a new development requiring that they take care of the environment that, that they use energy efficient, um, energy efficient appliances, energy efficient building, insulation, all that kind of stuff to reduce their footprint. And, um, and with the vehicles, we need, there needs to be some substantial financial commitment to converting over to electric or with, um, with diesel trucks, you know, finding the ones that are more efficient and don't emit as much. Um, there needs to be a very significant increase in the results on greenhouse gas emissions. So I just wanted to share with you some of this. Um, in addition to that, uh, the sea level rise sections are, I think, insufficient. They don't deal with um, salt water infiltration much. Um, that needs to be dealt with. Um, and it focuses on, it has a lot in there about sort of a, what I would call a disaster recovery plan. And I think instead of that, it makes more sense to invest in prevention. Um, a Tumwater open house, their consultant said that for every dollar you spend on prevention, you save $6 on cleaning up afterwards. And I think when you're talking about economic feasibility, that needs to be taken into account. Um, there's also no mention here of cleaning up pollution. If we expect there to be widespread flooding, it's going to take all those contaminants and flood the waterways, and you know the wildlife are going to suffer, and so is everybody else. So that needs to be taken care of as a preventive measure. Um, the other thing is, I want I would really like to see reliance on best available science rather than best management practices because those always lag. And frankly, if you follow what the forestry best management practices are, it's not gonna increase, increase the sequestration at all. So I have, there's more detail in here. <laughs> like in the Olympics or something. Yeah, did you have a question? Oh no, I just was hoping to be able to see those. Yeah, there you go, thank you. Okay, and then Polly's going to go ahead and promote folks to presenters or panelists. I think it looks like Phyllis is up. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Phyllis. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Phyllis Farrell. I live in the unincorporated uh, Thurston County. Uh, I'm glad to be here and thank you all for what you are doing. And I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, comment on uh, the previous meeting on rural housing. And I would like you to uh, keep in mind and, and your discussions uh, uh, maintaining the lens of the Thurston Sustainable uh, Report, 
uh, advocating for a 5% uh, rural housing uh, in growth. And if every all your discussions, uh, you know, are are focused on maintaining that five or six percent uh, rural um, housing uh, growth, uh, that that might uh, uh, alter your your conclusions. And secondly, I wanted to comment on uh, the climate change uh, element that you're going to be discussing tonight in. Uh, the major I, uh, idea I would like to um, uh, convey tonight is uh, Thurston County uh, committed to a uh, Thurston County uh, or Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan. And that plan has 72 actions. And I would encourage you to uh, make sure all of your discussions uh, uh, keep that in mind. And uh, further those 72 actions that that uh, we need to adopt. We're behind in our, our, our goals uh, for uh, the TCMP. And not only do we need to try to meet those goals, we need to um, accelerate our efforts. So um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Andrew, would you mind closing that down? Uh, is there anybody else online? Okay, just one last call. If folks online would like to give public comment, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we're going to move on. All right, um, with that, we will move on to new business. And first up in new business is work session number one with the capital improvement program. I'll just share my screen with you all. Hi everyone, Anna Rodriguez. You all have heard me speak before, but this time it's about the capital improvement program. Um, so today's work session will consist of essentially two parts. There'll be an overview of the CIP, and we'll dive into some of the different sections and um, highlighting projects within them, and then we'll uh, move on to questions. I will note we do have staff from Public Works and Central Services here tonight. So should you have questions for them, I'll make space after each section for them to chime in and you all to ask them if you have any clarifying questions. We also have Assistant County Manager Robin Campbell here tonight. So to start an overview of the CIP, um, the CIP is, as I'm sure some of you may know, maybe not all of you know, it is Appendix G in the Thurston County Comprehensive Plan. And so the CIP is a six year plan for financing capital improvement projects. Um, and the purpose of this plan and the capital facilities plan is to use sound fiscal policies to provide adequate public facilities. Um, I will note at this time though, this is a planning document and not a budget document. Um, so while there are dollar amount estimates on the slides that will follow, don't hold me to that. Um, simply a planning document, um, it all comes down to uh, budgetary decisions. So capital facilities planning and CIP is a coordinated effort. So CPED, we kind of bring together the partners necessary for producing and developing this uh, plan. Public Works and Central Services do all of the heavy lifting, especially Public Works. Um, there are tons of projects involved and a lot of planning on their part and um, budgeting and all of that much. And then also the budget office. Um, they ensure that the capital project, capital project funding plans are coordinated with the county's annual budgets. Um, you also notice on this slide, we have school and fire districts. They're here as a part of it. However, they do have their own CIPs that they implement um, separately from ours. What are capital facilities? That's a great question. Um, there are public infrastructure needed to support new growth, and that includes things like roads, bridges, water, sewer, um, and some of the other examples here on this slide. Uh, each jurisdiction defines their capital facilities and identifies what facilities are necessary to support development. 
and jurisdictions can set the thresholds for the size and life of the projects. Um, it is important to note projects using REIT funds or impact fees must be included in the CIP. Okay, as I mentioned um, on a previous slide, the CIP is Appendix G in the Comprehensive Plan. Um, this behemoth document reflects a six-year planning timeline and it is updated annually. Um, it's consistent with the county budget. The different departments set priorities within each division and they identify revenue and project costs. Um, this document as well prioritizes and describes different capital projects and establishes the timelines for those projects. So the planning commission role in the CIP process. Um, today, I'm giving you a high level overview of the updated CIP. Um, you'll have an opportunity to ask department staff any questions, um, and then you all will host a public hearing, gather public comment, similarly to all of the things that come through you all. You'll provide a recommendation to the board, um, and then we will move that forward through the board's process as well. Okay, on to the different sections. Um, these, as I move forward through the upcoming slides, they'll follow a mirroring pattern. Um, there'll be kind of an introduction and context to the section, and then a secondary slide with some highlighting projects. And then I'll open it up for you all to ask questions to staff, and then we'll just keep moving forward. So to start parks and trails projects, um, they're designed to complete required infrastructure repairs, add capacity to existing facilities, and reduce required maintenance costs. They're selected based upon system needs, community input, funding availability, and professional judgment. And funding sources for these projects include REIT, impact fees, federal grants, um, and conservation futures. Um, and there's an estimated 10.6 million over the next six years. So some project highlights included in the parks and trail section um, include uh, Gate Elmore Trail, Glacial Heritage, um, and Burfoot Trail System Footbridge Stairway Phase 1. Um, and at this time, actually, since I'm showing my screen, I can't see the participants, but um, if Ed is here, um, he is Parks and Trails. However, uh, Shannon Shula is also online and can answer questions if necessary, should you have any at this time. On to solid waste projects. Um, they're designed to provide efficient, reliable, and affordable solid waste collection, handling, recycling, and disposal services. Uh, they're selected to improve public and employee safety and security, address current and future operational needs, and meet legal and regulatory requirements. And funding source um, includes grants as well as a solid waste fund. And in the CIP, there are an estimated $39.9 million over the next six years. Some upcoming major projects include um, possible South County transfer station, Rainier drop box renovation, security, technology, and electrical improvements, as well as work uh, site configuration. You all have any questions for Solway staff for Jeff or for me? The next question I have is: there sufficient funds in that $39.9 million to accomplish everything in six years that they've got listed there? I do not have the answer to that. Um, yeah. Jeff, are you online? I am. Are you able to answer that? Uh, well, it's uh, actually, we'll probably be looking at some potential, you know, looking for, uh, try to leverage some additional grants and but also potentially looking at, because uh, there's two really large projects in there. It's just the, the potential South County transfer if you were to move forward with that. And then the waste and recovery center sites reconfiguration. So, looking at that, we have a significant amount of funds available, but um, you could look at again leveraging grants and potentially the public works. Um, uh, there's a public works, so I'm not shoot the name of it, so it's uh, leaving me right now, where you can also look at the low, very low interest loans. It's, it's where a lot of the solid waste um, tax that we pay on every ton that goes into a lot of it is, is diverted into that particular fund. Uh, that's available for for grants and low interest loans. So the public works trust fund. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Public works trust fund. God, that's it. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> and what what makes up that fund, Ms. Campbell? The public works trust fund. That is a state fund that we would apply to. Okay. For all public works for the 39 counties in the state. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
What are the potential sites being considered for the South County transfer station? Is that, is that known? Currently, we had a, a, a siting study but performed by uh, HDR, our consultant, and it boiled down, uh, looking at all the all South County down to the top two sites. Um, the one of them is actually an expansion of the Rainier, an existing Rainier Dropbox site. It expanded that to be larger to, um, which is actually on county uh, owned property. It's the Rainier Pits, which is adjacent to us. And the other top option was a private piece of property located near um, Military Road. And um, it was basically cross Military Road from where the um, Silver Springs composting facility is in that vicinity. So that was kind of the two leading candidates at that time. So, and we have not uh, gone any further than that at this point. I see. And in terms of the Rainier Dropbox renovation, uh, could you give any specific, any more specific details about that? Well, that that is basically on hold, and depending on the status of whether we were to develop a new South County transfer station. Um, if we were to just go with our two, we have one at Rainier and one at in Rochester, two small drop box facilities. If we were to not build a new facility, we would do some uh, upgrades of those two drop boxes. Because they are at capacity very frequently and they're they're small and they need some improvements if we were not to, to go out and look at it actually a new facility, a large or upgraded facility. It sounds like kind of an either or proposal. It, exactly. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Jeff? Yeah, one question. Um, the Vactrin Street Sweeping Decant Facility, um, is that for public entities primarily, or is that, and what's its capacity? Um, as far as the capacity and tons, are, I, I don't have that information, but uh, essentially it's for um, of our public works, it's for uh, Thurston County usage. Uh, so basically, um, if somebody else, like another agency, wanted to decant, they would need to find their own facility. Um, all of the wastewater that comes off of that uh, eventually goes to to lot, um, and you know it's, it's so currently it's it's for Thurston County Public Works and use. Okay, none of the none of the surrounding cities are able to use it. That is correct at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Two stormwater utility projects. Uh, these are designed to reduce localized flooding and improve water quality within the county. Um, projects will include capital replacement projects um, as infrastructure continues to age due to the end of lifespan of county assets. These projects are selected to meet state and federal requirements and they're reviewed by, um, well, on this slide, it does say the Storm and Surface Water Advisory Board. I will note that is shifting to the Water Resources Advisory Board. Um, the board is still in the process of appointing folks to that. So this name no longer exists, but it's still semi-relevant because RAB has not been flushed out yet. Um, and funding sources for stormwater utility include uh, utility fees and grants, and there's an estimated 8 million um, in dollars over the next six years. Um, I guess this ties pretty directly into what uh, Betsy was talking about regarding uh, flood-based pollution and especially the increase in that climate change. I was just wondering if we're looking at with this particular uh, uh, projection, um, is that taking into account the the increase in flooding that we're looking at overall? I mean, both both in terms of rising sea level in the longer term and just increased. Uh, storms in the short term. I know that at least I have experienced a lot more flooding um, within the last five years than I did the five before that and the five before that. Mm -hmm. So like, are we seeing these numbers increase as we're getting more dense populations and higher flood areas? Let me see. It doesn't look like Joe was online. Um, yeah, I, can, I can take a stab at that. Thank you. Um, Tim Wilson, Water Resources Manager with Public Works. Uh, great question. What I what I can tell you is all of our stormwater utility projects um, that are designed to alleviate local flooding and improve water quality are designed to the current uh, drainage design and er erosion control manual. That's at Ecology 
approved planning uh, document that um, is updated uh, roughly every six years. And during that process, uh, whether, you know, water models are taken into account and adjusted uh, for climate change. So it's an evolving uh, document and those are the standards for our stormwater projects. Um, so we designed to that manual. Uh, in addition to that, the county is in the midst of a uh, about a year and a half long uh, project, a stormwater comprehensive uh, study that does take into account uh, climate change uh, as part of those considerations. So there will probably be some information that comes out uh, at, at the tail end uh, of that uh, study. So hopefully that answers your question. It does get uh, to a lot of it. Thank you. I just uh, You said it's updated every six years, I guess. Where are we within that six year period? <laughs> Uh, yeah, our uh, drainage manual was just approved about 18 months ago, if memory serves. Uh, so we are uh, starting into the process. Uh, we follow Ecology's update of their manual. Um, so we're starting to plan for uh, the beginning of that process. Usually that's about an 18 month or two year process to get our manual updated. Uh, so the short answer is we're about uh, midway in between uh, update update of that six year manual. Thank you. Um, I guess this is just a general question that's going to come up for a few of these other ones, but just uh, it says in there that we're looking at uh, replacement due to aging infrastructure. I know that that's just generally an issue that we're dealing with in, in a lot of areas. Uh, are we? Uh, are we near the end of, I, I guess, I'm not sure where we're at generationally within our infrastructure. Are we looking at a large increase in, are we, are we nearing the end of a lot of our, our uh, current infrastructure in terms of what we're looking at in terms of upcoming expenses? Or are we, uh, are, are we sort of puttering along with like it being largely updated on the fly? Basically, are we nearing the end of the lifespan in, in stormwater at this point, but in, in a lot of these? You know, that's another great question. Thank you. Our, our uh, stormwater infrastructure, uh, some of it has in, been in place for decades. Uh, some of it is relatively new. Uh, so it kind of runs the gamut as far as uh, age of the infrastructure and uh, whether that is nearing the end of its useful life or not. What I can tell you is of the, you know, thousands uh, of um, individual pieces of infrastructure, catch basin, culverts, uh, stormwater pipes, ditches, swales, those types of things. We have a very, very robust um, um, uh, assessment program where most of that infrastructure is inspected biannually uh, and then condition assessments are uh, given to each individual piece of infrastructure. And then that prioritizes our work and where um, a lot of uh, the projects in our stormwater capital project in recent years have been to build new infrastructure. Uh, what we um, are uh, moving towards in portions of our capital program is kind of that programmatic uh, recapitalization, for lack of a better word, of that aging infrastructure. And, um, as an example, instead of waiting for a culvert to fail um, uh, before we uh, 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 schedule a replacement of that, uh, we are trying to get ahead of that using those condition assessments to prioritize our work to go out and grab a number of those culverts uh, each year and, and uh, get ahead of those programmatically and replace those. Thank you. And just to provide a little bit of context for everybody. So if we look at like Puget Sound as a whole, the maintenance back, or not just the maintenance backlog, but the, the infrastructure needs for stormwater in Puget Sound writ large are approximately $500 billion. We could spend the entire uh, bipartisan infrastructure law fund on just Puget Sound um, stormwater infrastructure. So this is a massive, massive undertaking. And um, I think the stormwater utility does a really good job of using available resources. So it's a it's a massive, massive problem. It's on par with the, the largest collective human endeavors ever spent money on. So, so. the space program. It is. Yeah. Uh, 
Tim, the eight million dollars over six years is that enough money to do what you've currently got planned without any major complications or unforeseen emergencies? Yeah, great, great question. Um, it, it is. It. Uh, it is enough to do our prioritized projects that are on the CIP. Um, uh, I think your next question may be, do we have the funding secured for that? We have an approved budget through the end of 2025, uh, but then we regularly uh, transfer uh, from stormwater fees that are collected. I, I don't have the number in front of me. I wanna say it's about $1.8 million on an annual basis into that capital fund that is uh, also um, well-funded at this point with a balance of, I'm I'm going to say about nine to $10 million. Robin may correct me uh, there, but I think that's that's pretty close. Okay, thank you. So some stormwater utility uh, project highlights, uh, upcoming major projects, Woodward Creek retrofit, site four, a meadow subdivision ponds retrofit and uh, wash dot US 101 Schneider Creek. Now on to water and sewer. Um, these projects are designed to provide safe, reliable drinking water for our customers and to provide the environmental health, uh, to preserve, excuse me, the environmental health of our community. Uh, they're selected to meet state and federal regulatory requirements and service demand. And funding sources include utility fees, REIT, uh, and ARPA funding. And there's an estimated 16.6 .6 million um, for the next six years. Some upcoming projects, uh, countywide. I said SCADA earlier, but I think I was told it's actually SCADA. Um, <laughs> systems upgrade, uh, Grand Mound Wastewater Class A Reclamation, um, and Grand Mound Wastewater Treatment Plant Phase 1 improvements. Um, any questions for staff? Oh, I was just going to ask if that includes if, if the water and sewer utilities projects include watersheds or if that's a separate infrastructure management. I think um, if I understand your question, I think that's a little bit uh, different. If you're thinking about watershed uh, scale planning, uh, that's a little bit different. And there is some overlap with the storm and surface water utility on that. This is specific. Uh, our water and sewer utilities are specific to the um, three uh, areas, uh, communities that we serve for water and four communities that we serve for uh, wastewater. Um, Sandy's got her hand up. We'll go to Sandy and then Mr. Kessinger. Thank you. Uh, can we go back to slide 15, please? I was curious about the American Rescue Plan Act grant and your sense of the impact of COVID era funding ending and how that will affect these projects. Yeah, great, great question. So the ARPA uh, projects, we have um, basically four different ARPA projects that are serving uh, two of our service areas, both the Boston Harbor and the Tamashan service areas, both of those communities, we serve with uh, potable water and sewer service. Uh, the ARPA funds, the American Recovery uh, Rescue Act funds came into the county and were um, allocated out on a priority basis by the Board of County Commissioners. You may be aware uh, the funds were allocated uh, to these projects. Uh, and what, what these projects will do is um, fairly large scale replacement of aging water lines and uh, sewer lines, uh, as well as replacement of uh, step tanks in the Boston Harbor community that are, um, that are prone to have uh, I and I, we call it, where uh, rainwater is infiltrating into the system and, and kind of maximizing out our plant and making our plant run at uh, much higher levels. Uh, than, than it should be. So we're addressing a lot of that aging infrastructure uh, within within these systems with the with these funds. So those funds are really directed then to sort of one-off major projects rather than trying to fund ongoing operations with 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, these these aren't going to fund uh, operations. This is these are um, infrastructure replacement projects. Thank you. You're welcome. So I could. Uh, thank you, Tim. You're doing great. Um, good evening, Robin Campbell, Assistant County Manager for Thurston County, and thank you for having us here this evening to review the CIP. I just wanted to add. Um, on to that response that um, the board uh, was very thoughtful when they authorized these projects. Um, we think it'll be a great benefit to the communities that we serve and um, the projects were structured in a way where we know that we can obligate them in accordance with the federal rules. By the end of this year, they will be under contract and they will be completed before the end of 26. Um, otherwise we lose the money. <laughs> so Public Works have been on top of that and they have a plan to complete the projects and they are construction as Tim said, um, and will be, uh, we're not investing in the ongoing operations. Thanks for your prudence and foresight there. <laughs> Just stay here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions on this section? Commissioner Pressman. Uh, on the, I know I saw under the transportation section upcoming next, uh, lots of fish passage barrier removal items. Do those only fall under transportation? Are there any fish passage barrier related items under any other category? I believe it's just transportation. However, I would need to confirm. Thank you. Any other questions? Transportation is a great segue. These projects are designed to provide safe, reliable transportation infrastructure, selected to meet capacity, safety, maintenance, and state and federal requirements. Um, there are several funding sources for transportation. Um, some large ones to consider, the County Road Fund, um, REIT, Public Works Trust Fund Loan, and many others that are included on there. Um, and for these transportation projects, an estimated $8.8 million over the next six years. Some upcoming major projects, Yelm Highway Southeast Pavement Preservation, Marvin Road Upgrade Phase One, Country Club Road Northwest at Green Cove Creek Culvert, replacement, say that five times fast, and um, road preservation and rehabilitation program. Any questions for transportation public work staff? Um, so that was public works and now we're shifting into uh, central services and different county facilities. Um, these projects, Sorry. oh, yes. Question on transportation. Sure. Uh, a, does anyone know the average cost of a roundabout? And B, does anyone know why they're so popular besides that they reduce accidents slightly? Um, I can answer that one. I apologize for my video not working. This is Matt Huntsman, Thurston County Engineer. Um, uh, roundabouts have a lot of efficiencies besides just safety. In terms of um, the ability to accommodate um, traffic, they can actually accommodate more traffic than a traffic signal can. Um, that being said, one of the you're absolutely right in that one of the major reasons why the county looks to install um, roundabouts is to reduce the severity of collisions, especially those intersections that have a high KSI, which means killed or seriously injured collision rates um, throughout the county. Um, and I apologize, I forget your first question. The average cost? Average cost varies, obviously, be, depending whether it's a single lane, double lane. But um, for construction costs, you can assume, like our Johnson Point project that we just bid, Johnson Point and Hawks Prairie, that's about $2 million um, to construct that roundabout. That's construction cost. What's the average total cost? Um, so the average total cost, when you include right-of-way and design and um, permitting mitigation is probably closer to $3 million. Thank you. 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 Th
Could you could you give us a, a little bit of a breakdown or maybe a thumbnail on how much money of that is coming uh, through general fund to you compared to pass through from other sources like uh, yes. the feds? So I can tell you there's when when you get into uh, the scale of projects such as the roundabout, um, we don't have enough um, county local funds to fully fund those projects ourselves. Um, so typically only the match requirement would come from the county road fund. We'd be looking at um, federal funded through the surface transportation block program, or we'd be looking for state funding through the transportation improvement board. Um, but um, the match on T the transportation improvement boards is typically only 20% of the project cost. And on the federal projects, it's typically only 13 and a half percent of the total project amount. That sounds like a good reason to do roundabouts there. It's a very good reason. <laughs> Mostly. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, Thank you. Uh, question Great Bartley. question. Um, uh, I just had a, a uh, kind of piggyback question about uh, like runoff management in terms of road construction. Um, and like for water management, it, uh, is there a significant difference with uh, stormwater runoff for uh, uh, roundabouts versus uh, traditional intersections. My experience with them would suggest that there is, but I don't know if that's just anecdotal. Um, typically, um, it's all based upon the amount of, of impervious surface. So typically, whether it's a traffic signal or roundabout or a traditional four-way stop intersection, the water surface treatment requirements are typically usually the same. The age of the infrastructure is more important to the surface water impacts than the um, the type of infrastructure. Interesting. So if it's an old um, old system or an, like old piece of infrastructure, um, it will have to come up to new standards. Mm -hmm. So anytime we do a triggering uh, replacement, we get stormwater benefits. Thank you. You're absolutely correct because some of the problems is is the stormwater standards didn't exist uh, more than. 30, 40 years ago. So when you're doing a project that hasn't been, or a location that hasn't been improved in that long, you're you're starting from zero basically and bringing it up to full water treatment re requirements. Measure passenger. I noticed in the funding sources on the summary by revenue source table 1-1, one -one, it talks about parks impact fees, talks about transportation impact fees. Those are the only two I see with the name impact fees. They're not huge amounts. They're 2 million, approximately two and a half million. Um, but are those impact fees ones associated with real estate development and are these the only ones that affect any of our CIP? Are there any other impact fees that come into CIP? So yeah, I can speak to that. So our traffic impact fees are basically are just development to pay for their um, their project impacts. So typically we'll collect traffic impact fees and generally we'll leverage those traffic impact fees for much larger amounts of federal or state funding so that we can typically they'll go towards capacity projects such as a roundabout installation. Those are the only two types that the county collects. There's also school impact fees and fire, fire district, but those don't come to the county for county projects. And some utility fees, but we only collect those for county properties. Uh, the utility fees are specifically for the utilities that the county operates. So it goes to a lot. Yeah. Yeah, because counties can't levy utility taxes. All right. County facilities. Um, I'm just going to start over on the slide because I don't think I actually kicked it off just now. Um, so they're designed to provide safe and sustainable public facilities to serve the public. They're selected based upon safety, health, accessibility, sustainability, operational efficiency, and effectiveness of the facilities. Um, and funding sources include REIT, Central Service Building Reserve, um, Detention Sales Tax, and others. 
and uh, for these central services uh, county facilities projects, an estimated 135.6 million over the next six years. Ms. Campbell, I noticed that doesn't include the bond. That does include the bond money. It does. Yes. It right up there on the front. Oh, okay. I can't read it. <laughs> okay, so that's that's what about 35 million now. Uh, we'll have about 35 million left after we probably a little more than that of the bond proceeds from the 50 million dollars that we issued a year or so ago. Okay, I noticed last week commissioners had a work session on the capital facilities project up there. Uh, is there any additional information you can provide to us at this time about that? Not at this time. They're considering whether or not they want to move forward with the remodel project or right. they um, thinking about doing something else. Okay. So we are, we are taking a look at what's feasible. Right. Um, Just including selling uh, infrastructure. We are thinking about what should we earn if we sold the okay. uh, properties. The question that I have then, does that $135.6 million over the next six years cover the costs of what needs to be done? I would say no. Um, yeah. I mean, if Realistic, we're being no. frank, uh, what needs to be done, uh, what that $135 million would cover is um, the cost to remodel to address space needs. Right. That's what our current plan is. Should the board change that plan, that amount would be substantially more. And if we were to address some of the infrastructure needs of our buildings, that number would be substantially more. But um, I think I've uh, discussed this with this commission before, that the plan that the board currently has uh, is to use money that we have available without raising taxes. So that's how we develop this plan, using available REIT money, uh, to make bond payments to the capacity of REIT 1 and um, using building reserve funds that we currently have available. Okay, there was discussion about uh, putting something on the ballot for a new, new bond initiative. There, There is um, discussion going on, but we are not very far down the road and it certainly would not be on this year's ballot. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow on to that. I'm just trying to follow looking at this revenue by source table. It talks about bonds future of 112 million. Um, I don't see a 30 or 50 million number in here for existing bonds. That's because we already issued the $50 million bond. I think that it was issued in 2022. Um, and we've been using the proceeds of that bond on the current Hilltop project. And uh, what you see on the table, I believe, and I, is Rick Thomas here to back me up? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Is this 15 um, million of central service building reserve? Some of that's right. What we've came from we've that? got money in the building reserves, but um, we would also, for some of those projects, to be able to afford them, the county would need to issue bonds. And uh, Rob, Robin, this is Rick from Central Services, Rick Thomas. Um, and just add to that, we're also anticipating a bond for the um, most recent public safety tax that was passed. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. Um, so two of the projects on this list, um, we are about to purchase a building for the Sheriff Law Enforcement. Um, and we'll do a remodel of that building to suit the sheriff. Um, the, we anticipate that project to cost a total of $20 million. And then we are also um, just at the beginning stages of the elections uh, remodel for the ballot processing center. We just completed the voter registration center at Motman and uh, we're now doing the ballot center uh, that also um, 
total project cost of that is anticipated to be around $10 million. Um, we're hoping that that will be finished, but between those two projects, we would need to issue uh, 30 million in bonds. We were anticipating this fall, but again, with the discussion with the board about how they wanna move forward with the courthouse, we might be able to use existing bond proceeds to pay for those two projects. Mm -hmm. And then if we need bonds for the courthouse project going forward, we would then issue bonds for that. So it's we're taking a comprehensive look at what can we do. So they're looking at uh, paying for those bonds if they take it out uh, from the public safety tax over the period of how many years? Uh, 20 years for the 20 million for the sheriff, 10 million, uh, 10 years for the 10 million for the ballot processing center. So it'd be two different bonds. Structure, the same issue, just structure. Grown and mm. <laughs> <laughs> and just to note before we move on, I think we're about running about 10 minutes over time, it looks like. But we can go ahead. I, I apologize. I'm not an, I'm entirely sure this counts as county facilities. There's only one project in the entire thing um, that talks to EVs. Um, and it's about adding electric vehicle charging to county facilities. And it says it's just planning stage. Um, I'm not trying to jump ahead, but a lot of the comments we got from the climate stuff are talking about improving our EV charging infrastructure. And I think the county can take a leading role in that by adding capacity at the facilities and the places that it owns. Um, I'm just curious, it sounds like there's enough money to do the big items and some interesting tactics we can take to get things moving on a lot of the other ones. I'm just curious how far out we think that project in general is from seeing tangible additional infrastructure. The EV. Um, so we have uh, been successful in getting grant money for the EV charging stations. Um, we're just at the beginning phases of that. Rick, can you talk a little more about the project? Uh, yes, Robin, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we've been working with uh, Rebecca Harvey in our office, as Robin said, working with Commerce on a uh, grant for EVs. The plan right now is to uh, put together a fleet um, EV system um, here at, <clears throat> excuse me, here at the um, Patterson parking lot, which is just adjacent to the atrium building here. Um, the plan would be to put in 20 charging stations and also associated with that grant would be the possibility of putting four charging stations out at the work. And um, as Robin said, we're kind of in the final negotiation stages with commerce, um, but we're very confident that we'll end up getting the grant for that. Our hope would then be to um, execute those projects in 2025. Thank you. Thank you. So a few things tied together into one question. There, this is five, six years planning. We know that we think further ahead than that, and we've got things and ideas of what might be coming eight, 10, 12 plus years out. I'm curious, what's the next big thing, say like a courthouse level type of large thing that's on the horizon that's not yet here that we're looking at. And I'm curious, there's not that I see very much of in relationship to things like green facilities for sea level rise, uh, things that have been talked about a lot that are going to have to happen, but I don't yet see planned. Um, and then there's things like, I wonder about, like I just read that there's just some approval for 34 more sheriff's vehicles. Uh, at the rate they reckon, that's about a month's worth. So is there <laughs> is there like going to be, I know a capital facility is not a vehicle, but it, what about the parking lots and all the security and everything that's needed for all those vehicles? So our new sheriff's building is in response to the growth in the sheriff's office. 
and includes um, space. We've, we've thought about parking for the vehicles that they're going to need. So um, uh, we're currently also looking for property we'd use for secure parking for the impounded vehicles that the sheriff has. So um, the project managers are doing a holistic look at what will the sheriff need to support a growing office? Because thanks to the voters, we've got that expanded capacity to pay for that. Didn't say anything about big projects looming on our future. Courthouse. Courthouse is going to be the big one. Next after that. Uh, we haven't thought that far ahead, quite frankly. If we could get a courthouse, we'd be uh, that would be a huge success. So upcoming county facilities projects, um, countywide security improvements, as was mentioned, the ballot processing center, uh, countywide solar energy system installations, and um, numerous building improvements and repairs. As was mentioned very early on in this presentation, schools and fire districts, um, they do have their own say, CIPs that are adopted separately, um, and their funding may come from impact fees, mitigation fees, bonds, levies different funding sources and grants. So before I move on to the process slide, I just want to take one second to uh, extend gratitude to the Public Works and Central Services, and especially Assistant County Manager Campbell for coming in person. Um, it's our job to be here, but not necessarily there. So uh, I'm glad that they came, especially considering the fact that they're actually able to answer your questions, uh, whereas I would not have been able to. So thank you to everyone online. Um, I am eternally grateful to you all. Um, yes. Okay. Um, anticipated process for this. Um, we're here today, um, schedule a public hearing for September 18th, and then, um, possibly return to the board for a second work session, but there's a possibility the board will not, um, wish to pursue a second work session. And that being said, we would return, um, to schedule a public hearing with the board and then have final action, uh, December 17th. Okay. Are there any questions on Eternal is a long time. Only planned for five or six years. <laughs> See, you guys need a motion from us, yes? Yeah. Yeah, I'd propose a motion to set a public hearing for September 18th, 2024 at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter as the matter may be heard on the 2025-2030 Capital Improvement Program. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion on the motion? Much of the information that we have currently is going to be available to the folks to process for that hearing. The CIP draft is currently online on the CIP webpage, um, I believe, as well as the other materials that were at the board work session. So they're all online available for folks should they need them. And my email address is on there as well for contact. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Have you received any public comments on this yet? We don't typically receive many. I guess I had a question about like just the, the overall the overall shape of this economically. It just seemed like we, we talked you talked very early on about like the scale of the, the uh, water treatment issues that we're facing versus the storm water specifically, just storm water specifically mm -hmm. like versus the the like eight million that was going for that. Mm -hmm. And then and I was like, oh, wow, yeah, well, that's a lot. That, there's a lot that needs to be done there. I guess we're not dedicating $8 million. There's like $128 million for, like, sheriff facilities and shit like that. I mean, stuff like that. really <laughs> <laughs> Projects that are publicly funded by the voters. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I my question is largely about, I guess, percentage. Like, I know that a lot of that, that that's those, those, uh, those projects are funded kind of by their own... Um, their their own items, but it does seem like there's a there's a ballooning of our budget towards a couple specific facilities and a couple specific projects. And I was wondering if you had a sense of how much of our overall budget was being um, consumed by this, like the the capital facilities projects around the sheriff's office and these other these other like larger infrastructure things. If you uh, if you think about the entire county budget which is probably around $450 million. 
Um, and we're talking about 135 on these projects. Yeah. But the, the uh, 450 is, um, uh, how can I describe it? Um, it's the money that's available for day to day. And, and that big amount includes bonds they were issue that will be paid over time. So the actual bond payments are only going to be about two or three million dollars a year. Um, we'll pay out the if we are so fortunate to do the projects. Um, we'll pay out that 135 in the moment from bond proceeds, but the payments will be over time. And then, do you have a sense of uh, how, like, like? Percentage-wise, how much uh, these kinds of projects are uh, spending now versus versus how much we were spending in them previously? Yeah, um, <laughs> we're about a hundred percent increase um, <laughs> for big projects. Uh, I I've been with the county since 2010, and in my first 10 years here, um, we weren't doing big projects. We were doing maintenance projects to keep the buildings running because that's what we could afford. Um, we didn't have funding for new buildings like we're buying for the sheriff or big renovation projects like we're doing for the auditor. Um, but the, the new revenue coming in the public safety sales tax and then the decision the board made to address space needs with our REIT funding, which is pretty much tapped out the REIT fund, um, that REIT one, if, to be specific, um, those are big projects that the county hadn't been taking on in the past. We're trying to address the needs now. Yeah, I guess, I sorry, guess. Just probably, yeah, uh, we're just sorry, sorry we've got a motion on the floor. Yeah, sorry. So I'd be happy to have an offline conversation with you. The, the, Staff here can give you my contact. I don't have a card on me, or I'd be happy to give you that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a motion to set a public hearing for the 18th. Um, any further discussion before we move to a vote? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That motion passes. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for being here. All right, um, moving on to continued business. We have work session number 20 for Thurston 2045. And tonight we'll be talking about the climate elements. Pause and throw out. Pause and Thank you, Anna, Andrew. Oh, send <laughs> goodbye. Talk to you later. Goodbye. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that cool the music that you all played when people were and down. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was a software update. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly arrived. Don't even get a nameplate. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. Don't worry. That's okay. And if I promise. You know what? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, well, thank you all. Should I just, should we dive in here? Or do oh, you want to start? Just a quick introduction. Yeah. We have seen you online. Now yes, we where? have you in person. So feel free to say hello and reintroduce yourself in yes. person. Thank you so much. <laughs> So Gretchen Miller, Cascadia Consulting Group, and as she mentioned, I was a, um, a little square in the very first meeting when we uh, with Oneza, when we were just describing kind of the basics of the climate element and what we were planning to do as part of this process. And so it's really fun to be back here and to be here in person. And I co-lead, I'm joined by my um, my a co-lead here, Andrea Martin, who is a little square, but um, big in presence, uh, even though she's online today. And we co-lead our planning facilitation line of business at Cascadia Consulting Group. And all of our climate element work uh, falls within 
that line of business. So really happy to be here today. And uh, Andrea, do you wanna, I know you were here at the last meeting as well, but uh, we'll turn it over to you for a quick introduction as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all this evening. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, as Gretchen said, Andrea Martin with Cascadia Consulting Group. I've been supporting development of this climate element um, and spoke with you all last month, I believe it was, um, focusing on the greenhouse gas emissions inventory with my colleagues. So excited to be back here tonight. Thanks. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive in. And a couple of just mentions too, in terms of the documents that will be most helpful for this. I know these are in your meeting packet. The memo is a really great resource, overview resource of the deeper dive, which is the attachment A, and that has all the policies that we'll be um, referencing today. But the slide deck gives the kind of 10,000 foot overview and then really looking uh, for your inputs both at that level, which is a higher level and a deeper dive if, if that's uh, if you're ready to give that level of, of input tonight as well. So with these two documents alongside some of our slides will be really helpful. And just just two really quick things. Um, we're very appreciative of how accommodating and fast Cascadia has been moving. This is a big lift to try to prepare all this information and it's not final. So I know we heard comments tonight and we'll continue to hear comments. We wanted to make sure that we brought something to you to start reacting to, um, especially with you know deadlines looming of wanting to hold hearings later this year. So know that we are open to that feedback um, and this is kind of the first touch. And we get to come back uh, yes. in September as well. So yeah, whatever you all are ready to share in terms of inputs tonight, and then also in September when we come back. So we can go ahead to the next slide, please, Andrea. Great. So this is a quick overview of what we'll be covering today in terms of the climate element update. So we've got one slide just to reorient ourselves to the project timeline. What are all the various different pieces that went into the draft policies that you all have as part of um, amendment or attachment A, I was gonna say amendment A, but it's attachment A. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, as well as the overview of the process itself. So I have a few talking points just to orient you all to the steps that we took to get to that attachment A. And then we'll start diving into the actual, again, the slides that we have, get the, you know, the policy decisions um, and, and what we're really trying to, what the, what the policies are really trying to address, but at that higher level. So you won't see the level of detail and the slides that we go through that you have in attachment A. So again, having attachment A alongside as, as we walk through these slides. And then we'll wrap up with the next steps. So where are we as a, as a full project team going from, from this meeting forward as we continue to refine these policies? You can go to the next slide, please. Great, so this is that development timeline that, that builds in both the timeline piece of when we did what, as well as what we did to get where we are to, tonight. And so we just wanted to really quickly walk through those key project milestones and the climate element development process. So on the far left, is it is your far left also? I just want to make sure. Um, in the spring and earlier this summer, we uh, started with a policy audit and gap analysis. So what are all the documents that we should be taking into consideration? You all as a county have done a lot of great work in the climate space already. So, so what is out there? And then related to that, where are we seeing some of the gaps? So that policy audit really, really played into uh, how we landed on the draft policies that we have today. And we're continuing to wrap up the climate vulnerability assessment, which was also a piece that went into the draft policies and the considerations there. We also completed the greenhouse gas emissions analysis, uh, which includes customization of an emissions scenario planning model as well. And we're continuing community and uh, county staff engagement at each of these main milestones in the project process, including community meetings, as well as really important uh, county staff interviews as well. So as these foundational analyses were finalized, we moved into the policy development phase of the planning process, which you'll see moving into that summer fall phase where we are right now. 
And, um, and that's where we've drafted both policies related to greenhouse gas emissions reduction, as well as resilience policies. And so these policies are in those two buckets and you'll see that in this attachment A. And um, as this docu or as this kind of image up here implies, then we will continue to iterate on these policies as we get that draft climate element together for your your all's review, and then turning that into a final element, and that will all that work will happen this fall. Any questions on the process before we? And I know you've seen many of these pieces before and heard about many of these pieces before, but before I move on, any questions about how we landed? where we are tonight and where we are in the process. You ready to get to it? Great, okay. And feel free, Andrea, too, to jump in if I miss anything as well. So a couple of things that we did wanna to note to you, the commerce, and, and we worked on this process with uh, commerce, uh, they have a climate element guidance document. And so just knowing that the process that we followed aligns very, you know, aligns very closely with the commerce's guidance document. So we use that as a foundational document to, to help us outline the process that we took in terms of policy development. And uh, the policies were also informed by the policy audit that we conducted earlier this year. Policy gaps that were identified were addressed using commerce's resources. And that's outlined in both of the documents that I mentioned, both the memo, as well as uh, the attachment to. And then other pieces that we really thought were important to orient you all around during policy development, we also included a policy rationale. So there's a lot of information in this attachment around the rationale for each policy, as well as the co-benefits associated with each particular policy and the compliance requirements. Um, so which, which compliance requirements hit on which policy. So we thought that those crosswalks were really important to capture in the document as we listed out, not just the policies, but how we got there and, and, and what they address and, and what they hit on. And uh, just also wanting to mention that, you know, this is, um, we also are introducing a climate symbol or notation to identify any existing VMT reduction or GHG emission, uh, GHG reductions and resilience policies outside of the climate element as well. So recognizing that there, again, you all as a county have done a lot of great work. So there are other policies that exist in other documents. And so we'll be uh, making sure that, that our document talks to these other documents. Anything on the process side, Andrea, that I didn't mention that we should before we dive in? No, that's not great. Next slide, we're getting there. We're getting to the policies. Okay, so this next slide here that you see basically is the, the scaffolding within which the, the chapter will be structured. And so you'll notice that the policies that are in this attachment are organized in this way. And these are the, you know, the buckets that we have policies under. And for each of these buckets, so zoning, buildings, and energy, I won't read them all out because you'll have we'll have a slide for each one that we'll walk through with each of you. Uh, they include both resilience and greenhouse gas reduction goals, as well as objectives and the policies associated with each of these key sectors. So that's the scaffolding. Are you all ready to, to dive in here? Any questions on the organization or the process? Yeah. All right. And to note as well, uh, because there we did the math, uh, and for each of these buckets, uh, we're estimating based on your timing, happy to spend as much time as you all want to discussing these, but about eight minutes per bucket or per sector. So we'll see how that goes. Just to, um, let us know if there's more time or less time that you want to spend on any of these. And also just mentioning, you know, because it's, it's a lot uh, that we will be back here in September too, and that any inputs that you have between now and when we meet with you all next, um, I know that the, the county staff are, will be excited to get those and, and get those over to us. I heard a challenge in there. <laughs> yeah, <I feel> like, <laughs> can we do it? They may need more popsicles. I don't know. Another one from one minute on economic development as it relates to the climate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, okay. 
So just a few more kind of orientation things. We do have there are 11 goals, 21 objectives, and 79 policies in the attachment A. And we have a few different guiding questions, just things for you all to think about as we walk through each of these sectors. And again, gathering as much input as you all are ready to share as we walk through each sector. So we've got the next slide here. So guiding questions, are there any goals, objectives, policies that you believe are particularly important to this community? Any specific goals that aren't adequately addressed? any conflicts or redundancies with current draft policies that need to be addressed. So again, any and all input, but these are some guiding questions that we wanted to put forward in front of mind for you all as we go into these, each of these sectors. All right, so we can go ahead and get started on the first one. So the, the first sector is zoning, buildings, and energy. And you'll see the two goal statements here associated with it. And, and then the policy directions on both, the policy direction on both the resilience side of things, as well as the mitigation side of things. And again, these are, the, the goals are intended to be, you know, the higher level the policy direction gives you a sense of what the policies within this attachment A we're looking to accomplish, uh, recognizing that there are, are so many policies um, that it would be dizzying to put them all in front of you on a slide. So would it be helpful for you all if I read what's here? Do you all wanna take a minute to read it yourself? Uh, and, and again, I, I can walk through all of them. I would, I would suggest pausing on each one and if there are any things that jump out at you or any pieces of input that you're ready to share as it relates to each sector before we move on to the next sector, maybe more digestible that I, way. I guess maybe it's just me. I'm just trying to, I'm having a hard time matching up what we got as a handout with what you're showing up there. The uh, attachment? Yeah. So are we on page 13 on the attachment? Oh, that's a good, let's do this. We're on page, I believe, page um, well, one and two, right? We are. It looks like the policy directions start around page four, I think, of the, the memorandum. I'm going to use your attachment. My page numbers are different. Well, we've got two different two sets of pages. We have slide numbers and page numbers. So there's the memorandum and then attachment A. Okay. Yeah, I want to make sure we're in attachment okay, so A. Attachment the A. Okay. Oh, yeah, I was in the same And the page, page numbers are contiguous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does and they might have a different one than I do? <laughs> okay, yeah, my page numbers are different than, than your page numbers. So I want to, I don't oh, want to call out two pages. Pages. Andrea, do you have the page, page number? Top of page four. Mm -hmm. top of page four. Yeah, the policy directions are in the top of the memorandum before the attachment A. Yeah. Um, and they start around page four. And then an attachment A, zoning, buildings, and energy policies are on page 13 of the overall document. All right. Yeah. So the goals are going to be the same as you see on the screen here. The policy directions are stated in the memo, but the actual policies are listed starting at page three for zoning goals and energy. See, I, I don't see the goals on here. I see the re resiliency policy direction and the mitigation policy direction. So, I guess we're looking at two different pages at the same time. So, I think you're should switch into a landscape portion. Yeah, it should go in. And then now we're in a question end. And here's where the goals national start. Yeah, the PowerPoint, I think, brings both yeah. the elements together in one place. Um, but the goals are in uh, attachment A. Yes. Okay. You see it? That's. Yeah. And okay. so this is the generalized. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to follow up for me. Yeah. The memo is, yeah, came before attachment A. So, yeah. And, are these... and it's a less of a deep dive, right? So if you're looking to just get a, a, a sense of what's, what the policies are trying to accomplish, the memo is, is a document for you. But if you're looking for the specifics on the actual policies, those are in attachment A. 
So right now, um, the slide that's up on the screen here is referencing page 13 in your meeting packet. Yeah. Starting on page 13. It's just that we have two numbering systems. Right. <laughs> Sorry <Yeah>. about that. <laughs> yeah. So maybe focusing on attachment A would be a good place to, to start. There's a lot more in attachment A, so it's more of a task for you all to, to get a sense. But I can just go ahead and, and as you're looking through attachment A and, and that page 13, starting on page 13, moving to page 14, page 15, um, different page numbers here. Okay, so yeah. basically what you're doing is you're just showing the goals up here, not the objectives. Right. It's the goals and then the policy direction. So we're, okay. we're adding, yeah, an additional term. Um, and I know it's how you all have done other planning processes before, right? We're presenting on the, the policy direction and then going to the actual policies are not on the slides because there are just too many to capture on the, on the slide. Okay. So, yeah. And if helpful, uh, I can go ahead and just read the goals and then just give you a sense of, of the policy direction. And, and we could stay at that level tonight, or we could get into the more specific policies, which are in attachment A. Yes, Commissioner. You won't read us anything that we can read ourselves. Okay, I will not. That makes me happy. Um, under resilience policy direction and mitigation policy direction, those three items each. Mm -hmm. Are these suggested that these do not currently exist and this would be new new policy directions for us? Or I'm shocked if these don't already exist. Right. So these are a combination of both. They're part of a gap analysis. And feel free to jump in here to Andrea. Um, so part of a gap analysis or where we felt like there needed to be stronger language. So we need to do more of something. Um, so it, it captures both of those things. Anything more on that, Andrea? Yeah, I would just say that it does intend to address any gaps, um, but in addition, build on and expand upon those existing policies. So recognizing that many of these topics are already covered in other policies, but um, the intent here would be to expand and build on those. Yeah, I, I can't sit here and read through this and and decipher it. I, I, this is something that you really got to look at. You got to compare, you know, your requirement R1, R2, R3, your mitigation M1, M2, M3 with your goals and objectives and crosswalk them back and forth really to make sense of it. So I think I do think it makes sense for tonight to yeah. sort of touch it at the high level so that you have a, a context yeah, and then walk. spend some quality time with the more detailed language. Um, and this, because we have time set aside for you to spend some quality time with all those attachments and come back with specific. Yeah, that's what I things. would need to do. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's a lot. It but just... this high level context is really important because these are areas that Cascadia identified after looking at all of the planning documents we've already had and crosswalking it with state yeah. requirements, best available science and or BMPs this is this is the area where we need more growth and beefing up of our policy. Yeah. So it's really looking to you all to like, what do you think of this list? Yeah, my, lists? my comment actually was there? trying to match what we were seeing yeah. up here yeah. with this here and it doesn't match up that way. So. I think I just figured out how to do it, but it took me a minute. Yeah. But so what yeah. we're asking is like, basically for us to give feedback on these kind of bigger policy directions. Yeah, yeah when you think about kind of the, okay. these different sectors, right? Uh, so this slide is zoning buildings and energy. And so when you think about that sector and to, to what Ashley was saying, right? Are, these are the things that really came to the top uh, based on that policy development process that I, that I walked us through in one of those first slides. And so if there's something that's surprising to you or you're like, yes, this is, you know, weatherization measures are incredibly, like something stands out more than something else uh, or something isn't here that you think should be here when you're thinking about that 10,000 foot level, uh, please flagging those types of things. 
Um, so going back to kind of those guiding questions that, that we brought forward, which are, are intended to be somewhat high level, right? So is there anything that's particularly important to, the, to your community? Is there anything that from a rule standpoint that isn't adequately addressed? Uh, are there any um, that you know of from your bandits point uh, conflicts or redundancies with current draft policies that need to be addressed? So. I have one tiny framing suggestion yes. under resilience policy direction on this one. It says support weatherization efforts and supporting weatherization is something that we do regardless of climate. I think that it should be framed in a climate change context in here. And you should maybe put some sort of statement about due to increasing severity of weather events due to climate change or something there. So this ties more closely with why it's here because otherwise it's just a building code thing. Yeah, it, it, yeah. That's just my my one quibble with with that. Okay. And I have one comment. Yeah. On the first uh, policy direction, it says consider how land use patterns and designations can improve resilience and lead to environmental justice outcomes. I think it would be probably more appropriate to say ensure that land use patterns and designations improve resilience more and lead to yes. environmental justice outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't going to be a uh, guided meditation session. <laughs> Visualize the sea levels low. <laughs> that would be quite theoretic, I think. But uh, Commissioner Pessinger. On goal number two, I'm a little lost. But I, practices that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance energy efficiency obviously very intertwined. Support environmental justice is all a whole different thing. I wouldn't make them the same goal. Mm -hmm. So you're you're suggesting to split those out into their own separate sections. Yeah, I mean, support environmental justice is a huge topic, totally unrelated in any way to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency. But it is also important. Yeah. I think it could make sense as its own standalone goal because it we would hope that goal one would also have environmental justice support environmental justice. Yeah, yeah environmental justice is sort of the climate change of climate change in terms of <laughs> just being a bunch of different things that like the reason the whole reason we separated this out to begin with was that it affects everything, right? And environmental justice is going to end up affecting everything. So having it be its own separate goal does make sense in that regard. Otherwise, there's not really a reason to have two separate goals. Somebody online, was that you, Andrea, that unmuted? Oh, yeah, I was just going to note um, in terms of the intersection between reducing greenhouse gas emissions and environmental justice, where that comes out in the policies is in thinking about where those energy efficiency enhancements are focused and making sure that we're supporting retrofits and building improvements um, in, you know, historically disadvantaged areas and communities um, so that they can, you know, so everyone can uh, realize those benefits associated with, with those types of improvements. I love that idea. I would love to hear how we, has it ever been done and how would we do it? Yeah, I guess an example could be focusing um, programming retrofit programs, for example, and financial assistance and rebate programs on lower income households and creating um, uh, requirements or um, you know conditions for focusing on low income households as priorities for those programs. Just, just one thing to keep in mind when we talk about adding more requirements for dating things for lower income folks. Uh, when we develop policies around that, I think it's really important to keep in mind that we shouldn't be producing a bunch of barriers for people who have fewer resources to prove, oh, I'm lower income, oh, I meet these criteria. A lot of times, because I'm in the state, right? Contracting is a great example. We're supposed to encourage uh, veteran-owned and minority-owned business patronage, but you get certified as those things that have become so cumbersome that it almost works against itself. Yeah. So I, I would just caution against policies that put the onus 
on the individuals who are in those positions to prove a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just going to be the marginal cases or those who have connections, and that doesn't really address justice. Sounds like it would make a good policy in and of itself. <laughs> Hopefully, it's get captured in the notes. Then, sorry. Yeah, my little bully pulpit there. How are we doing on our eight minutes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just about to do a time check. Is there anything more? Again, kind of at this higher level, since we're going to stick there tonight. Anything more on this sector, the zoning, buildings, and energy that sticks out indoors is something that you'd like to to flag for further consideration as we continue to refine the policies. And there's a lot of overlap. And so, yeah. You see some Cheryl, of yeah, when you move. Yeah. So we're moving? I'll go. We're doing I'll it. Go. Okay. So the next one is transportation here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is goal three. I won't read it because you can read it yourself. So I will hold you to that request. And then you'll see uh, the goal that's specific to transportation, as well as the policy direction uh, that we took for both the, on the resilience side as well as on the mitigation side. So, Anything that jumps out? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, three B. I think super important because it it is basically the thing that we have been inundated with public comment on, which is prioritizing development to increase housing diversity and supply in urban areas well-served by tra transit and other services while increasing resilience to climate impacts. What I would say is that the policies we have under that don't seem to speak to that, or they speak with a mixed voice. So we set this objective, let's focus it on, on uh, urban areas, right? And then our policies are things like expand multimodal travel options for rural communities to connect them to employment centers and essential services. That is saying, hey, these areas where we're saying are, are not good for population growth, let's invest dollars there to make transit easier. While I, I'm sympathetic, we have to be strategic about how we're going to spend our money. That almost disincentivizes the goal that we just set. Um, additionally, there's, there's goals in here about transit hubs and increasing transit. To my knowledge, we have very little transit service to rural county, um, and we don't have many transit hubs in unincorporated Thurston County. So I'm just curious where and with what services we're going to do. They sound good, but I don't know how adapted to our county's needs they are. So there's, it's hard, right? There's yeah. like rural, rural. Then there's also Grand Mound, which we've heard a lot of. Exactly. Oh, over the years working in Grand Mound, you know, on the subarea plan and whatnot, a desire to be more well connected to Centralia, like work with Lewis Transit and mm -hmm. see if you could provide connections down there. Not even inner city. Just, just but connect to the closest town to them, which would and be Centralia. There's been a lot of, um, you know, um, investments or at least interest in investments in bike, ped, and transit. So multimodal isn't just transit. It's bike and ped as well. I'm just curious how realistic bike lanes from rural county for employment is. No, but even within Grand. Within okay, Grand I, I, I suppose. I, looking at the CIP, there were six mentions of bike lane things and almost all of them for for stretches that were like half a mile and it's like we're expanding lanes and we're going to add a bike lane for this little chunk yeah um, and we have had the because transit is so heavy in the climate mitigation plan like mm -hmm. the climate mitigation plan because it covers the whole county yeah so we have been in conversations with what does it look like in a in a rural um setting and there are alternative public transportation options and that might even be better terminology than the more standard like transit yeah it's fixed route is not going to be feasible my main feedback is that these don't sound like bad ideas but they don't sound like they were written for our county they sound like generic things that were put in here and if we're talking about adding transit connection or grand bound but the policy is just expanding to rural it should say like we can have more than one policy and they should say our policy is we're going to connect grand mount to centralia like make it practical practical and more actionable so that when we read these things or people reviewing this in another five years read these things they can actually say oh this is a targeted fix we need a new policy or we need to we did that let's move on they don't feel like policies they feel like aspiration sentences under this and they don't seem very focused or tailored to the county that's just my my piece i'll step back now 
It's a lot right. like a Department of Commerce document, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on transportation? That... Yeah. <laughs> the electric ferries. <laughs> I guess, I guess the yeah. only additional thing I would have is like, there's a lot of talk about expanding EV infrastructure. Um, and I do get why that is, but uh, a lot of the gains that are going to be happening through uh, through individual, I mean, us is, is moving people one away from individual transit and then also moving, like in, improving the efficiency of the vehicles that people already have conversion rather than um, uh, buying fancy new cars, um, which most of us can't afford to do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if I had the money for for an EV, I would just put a down payment on a house. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Passenger, anything else on the sun? Yeah. Yes. Um, on transportation, I know this is a tie to climate, and I intend it that way. Uh, Commissioner Barley, you remember we had a discussion maybe a month ago about bigger transportation vision and tying into the entire, you know. I five corridor, the west uh, western Washington, like sound transit extension, uh, because uh, as we become even to some degree a commuter community for areas such as Tacoma and Seattle and others, it seems that we're not really at all plugged into all of the you know the light rail you know park and ride station tr train overlay that's coming down as far as maybe DuPont, but then it kind of ends and that we ought to, it's so close to us, we ought to be in order to reduce vehicle miles traveled, um, we ought to be having some plans to plug, to do something big picture to be more connected to that. Take the train out to Lacey Train Depot and go north. At the very least, I want to go to a Mariners game. Well, you can go to Mariners game on the choice trip. Oh, <laughs> choice trips create greenhouse gas emissions too. But uh, <laughs> yes, I guess that that does get to a larger like I guess supportive criticism. But like a criti criticism that I had, which was just around the idea of like a lot of what we have in here kind of treats uh, Thurston County as an island. Um, and a lot of what we're discussing, what we've discussed is the ways that we are really fundamentally integrated to the larger economy north and south of us. And that's going to have a huge impact on our policy, on, on our transit, on transportation policy specifically. So I would like to see a little bit more in terms of like, yeah, public transit connections. Absolutely. I'm talking about ways we can invest in that, but overall acknowledging that, that larger regional effect um, and how we can sort of feed off of each other. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I'm just not sure that the Thurston County Comprehensive Plan is the vehicle for doing that. So to speak. What's that? I said so to speak. I'm, I'm unsure if this is appropriate for transportation and I'm unsure what the county can actually do for it, but we're talking like I love EV infrastructure. I own an EV, it'd be super cool, but ultimately reducing total miles traveled period is going to be more impactful. Um, and I think there's maybe a possibility for the county to build some sort of incentive for Thurston County based businesses to um, increase like telework, remote work type things. Like um, I know a barrier to that a lot of times is IT infrastructure and it seems weird to put that in transportation, but if we incentivized, like if we had grants or businesses that had jobs that could be done remotely, but they don't have the infrastructure, like, hey, we'll help you upgrade your IT infrastructure if you commit to reducing so much mileage, because that ultimately saves us money. It's less wear on our roads, it's less environmental impacts, it's less to mitigate. I don't know. I just, I don't see it explored anywhere in here, and I think it's kind of a low-hanging fruit, right, because it's a, normally a one-time expenditure. It invests in the county it improves a lot, a number of other things. So I just wanted to mention it. There's a little of that's going to be in the UGA or the rural areas. It's true. I understand that. Didn't we decide that 
VMT was not going to be one of the metrics that we use for greenhouse gas reduction programs. It's a mixture of VMT and then uh, thought we were going to the other per mile, wasn't it? For the commercial, they were using the. I do not recall. Andrew, do you want to speak to that? Um, I will note that the commerce guidance, one of the requirements states that uh, policies result in reductions in per capita VMT without increasing greenhouse gas emissions elsewhere in Washington. So we definitely wanted to make sure we covered that requirement here. Yeah, if we decided that we didn't, it is still in uh, number two on mitigation. I don't think we could add but, yeah, I remember. No, we had I, a I thought that there. when we were looking at the different pathways we could take for measuring our our progress here, that BMT was not going to be the metric that we were going to use. We were going to use a different metric. I remember the two different metrics. I can't remember if it was BMT or related to something else. Yeah, could we double check that maybe? Yeah, yeah. Tail yes. circle back on that. I don't remember. Okay. I don't think it was tailpipe emissions, but. I wanted to think that we discarded VMT for the other option, which I can't remember now. And I remember having the discussion, and I don't re remember enough about it and why we went that direction. I remember talking about using a hybrid because commercial miles aren't. aren't yeah, aren't because I five way. throws everything off since there's and a it's, lot of it's like It's carbon impact, for, it's like tons for them. And there was some weird hybrid. I don't mm -hmm. know if that was what we were remembering. So you couldn't quantify I five in the ports. I can, I can find it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go through an old. I know that was a question, the meeting that I was here, that was a question that you all flagged, and then we well, got a response back to that. That's just not tailfair. That's pretty. pretty. You must have a hell of a file. It's just been there. She's, she's working her magic over here. All right, so ready to move to the next one? Ask. Okay, so the next one is waste management. Uh, I think you went. There oh, you go. There we go. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Great. So the next one is waste management. This is goal four. Limited to materials and organic waste. Anything on this one? It starts on page 21. If anybody does want to do the deeper dive alongside. Yeah, let's page 21 and 22. Anything on this that jumps out at you or resonates particularly with you all related to person community? There will be, but I don't have it right now. So I like, have yeah. for this. Yeah, this for this meeting, meeting, particular meeting. Okay. Anybody else have anything before we keep moving here? We can come back to it. We can come back to it. Okay. The next one is water resources management. So this is goal number five. This is specific to, same as, um, Waste management, where that that had mitigation policy direction only, whereas uh, water resources management has resilience policy direction only. So that's something no worries. Could you say that yes. again, please? Oh yeah, I was just flagging that that some of these have both policies that are related to resilience and policies that are related to mitigation, but some of the sectors are specific to one or the other. And why and is that? So. Just because it's a, I mean, you can maybe jump in here more if you want to describe that, Andrea. But it's uh, that there, um, there aren't, you know, policies that are specific to like as we look at waste management. Um, waste management is really focused on mitigation uh, versus resilience, and so they're just it. It isn't it really applicable. Like there is any good side. mitigation for water resource management. No, it's more, it, no, no more like climate mitigation. So like, this is not the only place water resource management yeah. lives. Like we had a whole separate presentation okay. a few months back. We've got water policies sprinkled throughout. This is just specific to. So this is redundant. Climate change. You don't have it here because we have it somewhere else. Yeah, we well, have water lots of other places. Right. It is very important. <laughs> but we also need to make sure that it is housed in the climate. Chapter two. Sprinkled pump. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just again, uh, a language use thing. Yep. Better understand and anticipate is not a policy, really. It's it, it doesn't feel like it's something we're doing, really. I mean, it's a direction. I, I suppose. Yeah. I just it would be. Search and analyze or something. Yeah. 
why? <laughs> I, yeah. I will say that for, it does. For what end? It, it does reflect where we actually where are. We are. True. Um, yeah, like we don't <laughs> know. So, like, this is the. We go back to last fall. There is a larger pot of money available to the county to do a lot of these follow up analyses. Um, to achieve that kind of policy. Like we don't know everything now. We don't have enough resources now or time to delve into some of this stuff, but making sure that we do have policies so that we can um, do that analysis. I mean, even if it said like to better inform future policy and actions, like just- It needs a follow-up. It needs something else. Like I'm, I'm not opposed to what it's saying. I'm just saying like, it doesn't feel like a complete policy. Well, it's not a policy. It's not, it's not a policy. policy. Yeah, I, I guess it's the directive. It, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's adding another term, right? right? Policy direction versus policy. <laughs> So we're really keeping you on your toes at 820. He's going, to be, he's going to be editing the whole comp plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will yeah. be requesting. So, but I would take that lens, like take that specificity lens when you look at the policies and if they aren't directive enough or specific enough, we really, we, we really welcome that kind of input. So yeah, we, we value actionable plans. And so if these policies, if there are policies in here that are not reading as action oriented as you all think they should, please flag those for us. And also start thinking about implementation plan. You'll see that we're starting to strip um, language from our policies, like for example, or such as, and take that and put it in an implementation plan rather than having policies that also include examples that may or may not be what we move forward with. So and that's, yeah. Anyway, that's a big deal. So as you look at water resources management, any other flags or things? And again, on the slide is the policy direction. The policies themselves are in your attachment A. But anything kind of at this higher level that is surprising to you is particularly resonating with you? Yes. Commissioner. I love just, I I don't know that we need to change anything here, but it, this is focused on protect and minimize. And uh, I think we ought to be proactive and I would hope we come up with some policies for expanding the water yes. availability, whether it's creating a new reservoir or whatever, but I would look for not just uh, limiting damage, but expanding access. I agree with that. Thank you. Ready to move on to the next one? Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, community well being and emergency services. This is the next sector. And we've got resilience policies in particular under this one. And just to circle back to comments that we heard from Thurston Climate Action Team, because they've been working on this emergency or they're gonna be kicking off an emergency preparedness plan. I know Amelia has already met with them once and so we've opened that communication line uh, to make sure that our parallel planning efforts are complementary. Thank you. This looks like it's where a lot of environmental justice lives. mention of environmental justice in the goal actually might make more sense here or also here. He's doing a report out on the VMT. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Anything? You started the second bullet there. Yeah. <laughs> The point yeah, about VMT, VMT has always been a, a method we have used, but it was the emission reduction goal, target that I, was a I choice. That's what I was trying okay. to say. Between what we currently have for the county and the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan versus what commerce guidance is. So there's the 45% reduction by 2030, 85% reduction by 2050, which is in our Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan versus commerce guidance, which is the net zero by 2050. And just sort of the difficulties around trying to, what does net zero look like? So anyway. 
we have to know where you are now in order to figure that out. She has to go deep. She has to go back to a power plane. I think May first. Yes, <laughs> I found it. Just, okay. just adding on. Yes. Commissioner Passenger pointed out. I'm, I'm not saying that environmental justice in point two is bad. I'm just saying that it feels like environmental justice really permeates all of these things. So it might make more sense in the goal than just in the directions. I think that would change it substantively because if we're speaking to environmental justice broadly, it would also include uh, meaningful involvement mm -hmm. um, oh. versus the. Uh, then that adds a direction about. Consultation and involvement, wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. I think that belongs here because I don't think it exists anywhere in here right now. Do you mind repeating that? So, okay, if we elevate environmental justice outcomes to the goal, then we should add a direction about communication. Well, con but specifically, it's meaningful involvement. Meaningful involvement, sorry. Yeah, you can it's better than communication. Yeah, we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, um, but meaningful involvement from uh, from those most impacted. Uh, by... I'm going to make sure Miriam's team is on it. Yeah. What we're going to put in <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, teamwork. Anything else on this one? Okay, we can move to the next bucket or sector, which is cultural resources and practices. One goal statement here, three policy directions under that resilience side of things. And for those Diving a little deeper, it's page 28. The actual policies. Sorry. Uh, we've, we've received feedback in the past in a number of sessions about not calling out wildlife explicitly more often. I understand that wildlife are part of ecosystems, but I think the second bullet would benefit from a direct call out to wildlife. I was going to go a step further. Um, I think there's a lot of cultural resources we ought to work to protect, but there's just an iconic one that's like I just drove past the signage for the Nisbali Drive and a giant picture of a fish. Fish, can we call out fish, salmon specifically? Just a really quick language thing uh, to meet and water quality to meet tribal treaty rights. What do we mean by meet tribal treaty rights? Is it meet treaty obligations? That's it, the it's us who, yeah, you know, they have the rights, we have the obligation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fulfill. Fulfill yeah. uh, our obligations to tribal treaty rights. I see and i really appreciate the government to government relations when it comes to archaeological sites and traditional cultural properties i actually do think that that government to government relation is like kind of permeates all three of these these uh topics like when we're talking about management of these resources that's a very very much a government to government priority is it is it worth specifically mentioning consultation not just working with the tribes, and that is the formal legal framework for interacting with the tribes. It's just worth considering. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's critical to point out, but uh, these are sovereign nations or counties. They view it that way. Yeah. Um, when we say government to government, when we send county representatives to speak to them, they don't want us to speak to their chair. They want us to speak to their people that are at our level. Yes. And we need to be respectful of that. And I think that's covered when we say we maintain government to government, but I just want to remind. Anything else on this one? Okay. Before we move to the next sector. On that note, we yeah. have been meeting um, monthly with with the tribes and that government to government space and Amelia has been the lead on that. 
Evergreen offers some weekend courses on uh, tribal relations and government to government stuff that are worth the money if you've got some free time. So the next one is environment and ecosystems, and this has policies in both the resilience side as well as the mitigation side. And so the policy directions capture both of those. And here's one goal associated with environment and ecosystems. Questions? Um, and actually, maybe this is for you. You had talked about some study the forest tree cover or canopy cover study in the tree coming tree canopy assessment. When yeah. is that? Is that part of this? That's totally separate from this. It's separate, and we we hope to have like maps and the data analysis component complete in the near term, like within the next few weeks. Having it be a full report, we are a little bit resource constrained. I guess I see on here. The first resilience falls be directed in the prairie habitat habitat for animals and not agriculture fisheries. Um, I would let's maybe say something about trees and forests and tree cover. Yeah, and there is a whole separate section just on forest, mm -hmm. forest land. Um, but I think it. Bears, so you know, forestry and canopy cover wouldn't be covered under necessarily priority habitats or critical areas. Um, so I think looking at canopy cover, can canopy cover as an ecosystem, not a resource, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I think could be important. I think we should probably have an entire policy direction on it. Yeah, I guess overall, my 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 feedback on this is like we, we had some really good breakdown in a bunch of the other sections about what what specifically what 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 uh micro direction is of right, we're going for within within the larger policy directions on a lot of these and and this is a little a little bundled this is uh a little a little uh condensed i'd like to see i'd like to see that focus mm. of of really highlighting some of these issues that we're discussing here around I like that you have. I like that corridors is their own thing. Someone definitely has been listening to me. <laughs> so, you, just so I'm understanding what the ask is, you feel like this is too. We're fitting too many things in too many under things one too, policy too, direction, yeah. and and your request is to separate them out. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Specifically around canopy cover as its own ecosystem um, direction, I think that's an important one. Um, I would also like to uh, split uh, out uh, the ecosystem management a little bit more. I like that forest is mentioned under mitigation policy direction, but I would also like it mentioned under resilience policy. Precisely. Thank you. Yeah, I think it really spans both. It is the resilience tool we have. And there is a, we can hold those thoughts and yep. see if they're addressed in the forest forestry section because it because it is such a key component of the climate mitigation plan and the carbon sequestration white paper. Um, not to say that there you won't have additional comments, but you know, deciding where we really want them to live. Um, where is forest? I don't see it. In the the title. Well, sorry, I was there. I just know what yeah. forestry stuff lives in a different place. I'm not sure what the title. I know I looked through a lot of forest. <laughs> There's a explicit objective um, that focuses on protecting and enhancing resilience of forests. And there's there's. Um, also apologize to speak to working with partners because we don't have control over a lot of forest lands here, yeah. but working with partners to change those policies and mm -hmm. try to support um, more climate resilient forest management plans. Yeah. Um, this is an area where I think um, policy framework is important because there's a lot of opportunity. So it's not an area where the county currently you know, manages a lot of its forest land, but it could be an area in the future. Um, I think 
my point is I think it could be important to see a distinction between um, trees and forests in a like a development context when we're thinking about like priority habitat and species or critical areas in the same way we we should be thinking about canopy cover in a development context as well as a forestry context. Mm -hmm. And we can look at the cross section of chapter nine, the environment chapter mm -hmm. does have a large portion of the tree canopy and forestry in it. We can definitely find out where those connections are. So um, you said, if you wouldn't mind repeating yourself. Yeah, uh, so- The distinction between canopy cover as forestry- like In a resource management sense okay. versus a, like natural resources versus development. Just to reinforce what we've said before about wanting wildlife to be a little bit more separated out and as a specific uh, goal in and of itself, rather than a uh, service that is provided elsewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, in, I'm trying to remember previous conversation because I am not an expert on this. But one of the specific policies is a no net loss of ecosystems. And if I'm remembering the conversation correctly, this was a, a sort of a perspective that treated an acre of land as an acre of land, regardless of whether it was contiguous, the age of it, um, you know, cutting down forest to build a big box and planting forest somewhere else does not, I mean, it might be a no net change in total number of forest land, but they are not functionally equivalent. I um, thought it was not acreage, but it's ecosystem acreage. function is the standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hard yeah. measure. Neat. Yeah, impossible essentially to me. I, I, I mean, it's listed here. I just, I don't know. I'm. I remember us having this conversation, and I just wanted to bring attention to it because I feel like I need more highlighting. Mm -hmm. And and one of the next steps that the county would need to take is really understanding um, the ecological functions from from that like monetary perspective. And I mean, I know Kitsap County has done this. Um, they're on phase two. Um, and it's it's not something that we have really the resources for that effort into. Gotcha. Okay. Just wanna make sure I it up. Uh, I guess one one other thing that's worth bearing in, like like as a as a as a little bit more highlighted is uh, the changes that are happening, like making sure that our preservation goals take into account the fact that these happen that the land that that these. Uh, ecosystems are on is going to have to change <laughs> the system the, the like i mean it's part it's implicit in corridors in terms of how we've been discussing it and i just want to make sure that it's implicit in um in in discussing um corridors or land management overall is that the the physical land that a forest or a wetland or or these other mitigation things is sitting on is going to be shifting as the climate shifts like as the saltwater encroaches as was mentioned earlier um and making sure that our our policy directions take that into it. Mm -hmm. And we are definitely having those conversations with our tribal partners as well as others as it relates to salmon bearing waterways, and then definitely looking at it as it relates to um, our our prairies, our prairie habitats that we're conserving. Anything more on environment and ecosystems? It's been encompasses terrestrial aquatic species habitat services. Anything more on this one? Move us along. Move you <laughs> along. You're ready to go. Let's do it. I think Andrea already has. Okay, this next one is agriculture and food services. So the aim of this section here is to address key resilience and GHG emission reduction measures in the ag and food system sectors, which includes production and distribution of food. Anything here? You want to call out, or you feel like it's missing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm concerned about soil. Um, I think I think that we've heard historical stories about lot of ways we can lose soil, lose soil productivity. You know, whether it's we can salt our fields if we want to direct, and we could. Uh, do a dust bowl scenario if we wanted to lose them all. Um, what can we do to regrow them or mitigate? Uh, we've there, I, I've read a lot about Western Washington soils having you know millennia of rains causing leaching of nutrients. 
and that, for example, hay from Western Washington has half the nutritional nutritional qualities as hay from Eastern Washington. Um, That's not true. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I was waiting. I've read that. But... Say anything. <laughs> I heard that from somebody that doesn't know anything about making hay. <laughs> okay. I'll trust the haymaker. You want to correct the record? I guess my question still stands, though, and I wish Commissioner Hansen was here because he's formerly done some ranching with a focus on soil um, regeneration. A, it seems I should be in there. And B, um, Debate specific policies or ideas, but I just think we should mention it and and look for opportunities. Do you have a policy in there about um, expanding regenerative farming practices? So that's a specific policy, but take a look at it and see if it should be strengthened or if there should be more added to it. It sounds like specifically he's asking for a call out for soil. Yeah, um, preventive. Yeah. It makes sense. And I think a public commenter said something about saltwater intrusion and obviously with the mitigating impacts there and things like that. So it's worth consideration of just number sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And I will, so for those commissioners that were not here last year when the agriculture code updates came through, but even last year we were trying to look ahead to things like climate resiliency and regenerative practices. So new uses like biochar production facilities like at a commercial scale like those are now actually listed as allowed uses for in long-term ag zone as forward looking like how do we how do we bring these things to market to scale and so yeah i think in in this particular sector you there have been more implementation actions actually than a lot of the other things anything more on this one before we move yeah, I just, yeah. I mean, I always get nervous, especially in when you're talking about goals, mm -hmm. you, citing specifics, you know, in here there's a, a specific, obviously there's a specific mention of regenerative agriculture. And, you know, five years ago, that wasn't even a thing. So this is a 20 year planning policy. If in 10 years, regenerative agriculture is not what we want anymore, but it's still called out specifically in our plan, then we're gonna have an issue. Plus we're gonna have more trouble, you know, as the county is gonna have more trouble adopting policies to help with whatever comes next. The other thing is um, in here, there's a comment about encouraging no-till. That's a double-edged sword for, I think, for a lot of people because encouraging no-till by definition, encourages chemical usage. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's always, and I talk about it all the time when we talk to people about agriculture, it's, it's the balance, right? There's the art of agriculture and there's the science. You know, I can tell you exactly what it takes to grow a ton of hay, but you know what? The weather might change tomorrow and it, it's not going to work that way. So it's always, it's always some sort of balance there. And so like, I, I just, I mean, the specifics I'm not comfortable with because also, I mean, I think people around here probably think of no-till as a pretty new thing, but I was around my first no-till drill 30 years ago. So, and I, I mean, I don't have any idea what's coming next, what may come next, you know. I mean, I think um, policies around supporting our, our agricultural operators to adapt and provide the tools necessary. Like, it's really easy to say support regenerative ag, support no-till drilling, and yet there, were, there wasn't a no-till drill even available to Thurston County farmers until last year. Um, to access. And so I think it's the providing the support and the tools and the adaptive capacity that is probably more important than specifying exactly what those um, practices are going to be. Might it make more sense to use the, use the policies a little bit more to that end? And then maybe if there are specific things we we're trying to do, those might fit in the implementation plan. Would that make sense? Yeah. Nelson? 
Sure, Barbara. Yeah, I guess uh, in terms of when we're discussing regenerative agriculture, it's true that like that term is relatively new, but the idea behind that sort of restorative ecos like, like, uh, ecosystem style agriculture of, of an agriculture that restores soil health or builds soil health or builds, that's, that's very old. Um, that's millennia old. Um, and I think that we can we can phrase these things in such a way that we're talking about that end effect uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, necessarily depend on everyone having the same idea of what a particular trend is. Um, I, I do think that we should be focusing on soil health, and I think that Commissioner uh, Petzinger's point on that is is very astute. I'd like to see that as some separate thing. I think we can do that with that soil health, or just the the like. Preserving and, and enhancing the productivity of our agricultural lands over time. The natural uh, productivity. How we want to do that. Anything else on ag and food systems? Before we move to the next one, only two left. We're almost there. You answered the question I was going to ask. How many left? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How many left at the high level? The high level, <laughs> two. <laughs> and only one minute for this one. Like 20 oh. pages in your packet. Okay, so this next one is economic development, and this section addresses both key resilience and GHG emission reduction measures um, in the economic development sector and includes business continuity as well as opportunities. And so you'll see the policy directions for each on the resilience side and the mitigation side here. And for those brave enough to dive into the meeting packet, where that starts. It starts on page 36. On this, it's jumping out. 45 seconds in. Yeah. <laughs> it's right on time. Guys are envisioning your couches at home and dinner. I, I guess I just wonder if there's a there's a role in here for another environmental justice touch base, right? If we're going to incentivize new businesses um, or uh, expansions making those opportunities available to people who may have been historically disenfranchised from those opportunities or were uh, either health or economically disadvantaged by the things that those would be put in would be a good way to implement some environmental justice policies. That's all. Do you, yeah, that's a good flag. Um, there are a few in here, but take a look. Um, with that lens, when you when you dive back into these to see if it if it pops out enough as, as separate policies. Anything else? I don't. Yes. I don't think this is a fully formed thought, but um, I feel like we're missing a piece here on ensuring that economic development is like doesn't contribute to either emissions or uh, reduce re resiliency. The unintended impacts. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just thinking like of um, the data farms. Data farms. And that would, are, would just wipe out your, water, your rural yeah. water supply. Mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining, yeah. Oh, big stuff on the thing. Energy, yeah. energy, water sucks. And then I'm also thinking um, with so much transition away from like brick and mortar towards like online shopping and warehouses and the way that goods move. Mm -hmm. My last little bit on this is just, uh, I noticed there's a number of points in here that get to it. So it's worth separate, it's worth mentioning directly, but uh, democratizing the economy um, is important to uh, making it resilient. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I see that you know, there's a lot of points in here about labor unions and, and other groups and, and other forms of, of economic development, uh, democratization. I really appreciate that's in there. It's just worth hard highlighting. So that, that's a probably a 
again, environmental justice as well with yeah, exactly. the involvement. Mm -hmm. The big call out in this section of the policies is mostly focused on energy sector workers finding on ramps into a renewable thing, but I, I think there's there's more than that. It's not just, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many folks we have in like the petrochemical industry working in our county to begin with. Is that a, a thriving economic sector here? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine it's very big based on our current energy made up. But yeah, it's another one of those policies that it sounds good, but I'm not sure how tailored it is to the county. Oh, there's some registered laws. Which one is, which one yeah. specifically? Oh, I'm sorry. There's use? like 10. This is that general shift. Uh, it's the general shift okay. one. I'm, I apologize. I closed the, yep. the monster packet. Yeah. <laughs> I almost feel like this should be one sided. So then it would be a little easier to. The pay, yeah, it's harder to track on the page numbers. Mm -hmm. It'd be its own climate mitigation goal at that point. <laughs> Reduce the use of a uh, giant. Well, if you don't throw it away, it's so kind of general sense. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, it was uh, it was ten A two. Okay, ten A two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else here? Got one more. All right. Ready to go? Take us away, Gretchen. All right, let's do it. Okay, the next one is collaborations and partnerships. And this section um, is really, it really focuses on the role that Thurston County can play to support collaborations and partnerships for implementing climate action, uh, considering how important measures like education, advocacy, monitoring, and information sharing with other governments are in climate work. And that gets at some of your earlier flags about being part of the region, right? Um, as it relates to transportation and transportation planning this one. I think this is also an acknowledgement that we are not going to be able to address um, a lot of the climate change impacts mm -hmm. alone. Right. And so having a separate policy section that really highlights um, how important partnerships are to solving these bigger problems mm -hmm. um, and that the county should be a leader in establishing those partnerships rather than kind of leading for others to reach out to us. Yeah, I like this as long as it's not a sort of in, in between place projects that we don't want to try to manage on our own. Um, I think that this is, I, I, I agree with you about uh, that everything's gonna require a lot more partnership across the regions. Um, I just hope that it doesn't become a place where we're like, and we'll, exp like, we'll, we'll, we'll use our partnerships to figure out how we're going to, to, to manage this transportation problem or something. Solving our own problems. Yeah, we're entering into a lot of ILAs right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. Uh, well, thanks for getting out of hand. But yeah, how do we yeah. Well, and, and I think that this also speaks to the fact that we are trying to shift to this uh, doing planning at the watershed scale. And inherently, if you start doing planning at the watershed scale, your watershed doesn't follow your county boundaries. Yeah. And so, by virtue of doing landscape scale or watershed scale planning, you have to have this. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I agree. I just think it's an important, it's an increase in accountability rather than a decrease in. Who's on first is also really important with this. I, I think it might be worth calling out the like ecosystem scale yes. management. And then the thing that's inherent here that I don't see is the word leadership, which I think the county is intending to provide here. That's, that was my issue. Those two things. <laughs> that goes beyond the county. Still. Anything else on this one? I don't know if we need to make a special call out, but you know, at the moment we start talking about collaboration with businesses, we started looking at things like public private partnerships and we started looking at privatization. And I would go very far in cautioning us away from privatization of anything to do with protecting our natural resources or utilizing our natural resources. That gets right back into the the thing I was talking about, about democratizing the economy. We're talking about increased collaboration partnership that, it, that needs to start at the bottom up level. So you all have made it. Each of the sections, Yay. and just and before one nine, slide. and before that's nine, really, that's pretty good. Got the 
That's right endurance activity. Yeah. I don't tell you different. And managing page numbers. You all you all did both. You made it through and um, made it through the packet with page numbers, two-sided and all the things. Uh, so just a couple of next steps flags here. Uh, we need to get confirmation from Burke, uh, but are tentatively scheduled uh, to, to see you all again in some capacity on the 18th, your, your meeting in September. And we'll have the public comment period for the draft element is also uh, scheduled for September as well. So uh, anything more on this, Andrea, that you wanted to flag related to next steps? Um, last time we talked to you all about the climate vulnerability assessment and just to provide an update that that's still underway. And um, we would also hope to come back to you all uh, to share findings from that assessment as well. So that's TBD um, in terms of date, I think, but definitely want to make sure you all have an opportunity to review what we're finding through that process. I want to make a statement here. I, I know we scheduled this public hearing. I know that um, the problem we have with public hearings and the quickness or speed where we're at in our process, we're going to start telling people after September 18th, you don't get to make any more comments about this. No, the public, so th that isn't the public hearing. No. We we have been completing our chapters and trying to get them out to the public okay. ahead of your discussions. So public hearing September 18th, 18th is a public the, hearing. For the CIP. For the CIP. For the CIP. It says transportation and climate elements. No, it's a work and. session. For the... It says transportation and climate elements public hearing. No, it says work session 22, Thursday 2020. That's a different thing. No, the next no, line down. Separate the separate item. Now I get it. My apologies. Yep. Okay. It's, it's a formatting <laughs> thing. You're not reading it yeah. wrong. It's just a, there's not a clear delineation there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I do have some updates on the timeline for Thurston 2045. I wanted to thank Gretchen and you're traveling pretty far. So please feel free to get on the road because I want you to get home safely. <laughs> um, and if anything else comes up with climate, Amelia and I'll be sure to share it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you all. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Where are you coming down from, Seattle? Seattle. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least the traffic's not bad this time. That's true. And I'm going to be flying. And leaving at 6 o'clock. I mean, you're yeah. taking yeah. half the amount of time. Well, note that Gretchen went easy on us. She's She can really drive a conversation faster. <laughs> I think Ashley deserves an award for spinning this as 9 o'clock as an accomplishment. <laughs> she knows us. You said you'd get through CIP like and you went oh, 20 minutes over on that. I'm trying. <laughs> she can give you popsicles at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, awfully quiet. Um, any other 2045 updates? Yeah, so we we are realizing um that there is a lot of content and we want to make sure the planning commission has time Thank to you. adequately sit with it as well as the community. And so we are trying to build in a few more months into the planning commission review schedule. Um, still trying to get a public hearing draft done around the same time frame that we were hoping to have a public hearing, but allowing for a good month or two for follow-up work sessions for you all in the community to sit with it and not have a public hearing until the first part of next year. So we're still working on the details of what that timeline looks like, but you know, hoping to have a full-on draft um, November, kind of before the holidays, as a gift to you all and then <laughs> and then coming back in the new year with that public hearing and we're still looking at trying to schedule a saturday public hearing maybe even off site um down more in south thurston like i said a lot of details um and and that was a choice we made rather than individual public hearings for all the different chapters of the comp plan um, so that's just the general update. Um, we are still making headway on all of the other chapters. It's a lot. Um, and so just a huge um, thank you to our team. We are down quite a few people right now and still making the deadlines. So, and thanks to you too, because you have to review all of it. <laughs> I know no one likes it probably, but December is a five Sunday month. So if we needed to add capacity, we could theoretically 
had a special meeting in December. That's totally I don't think anyone said want to do it. <laughs> I'm just saying. And I'm not, you know, I think it's just, it's leaving that option open. Um, so I appreciate that. I would hate to do that to you all. I'd do it, but huh. all my family's on the other side of the country, the country so. so. <laughs> I think Commissioner Bumbarger should just come in and spend three hours with me editing the document. <laughs> Here's the thing, I probably would if our work hours didn't overlap. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else on 2045? No. Okay. Um, with that, we'll move on to staff updates. We are down a lot of people. We, we went from being like fully staffed to being down a lot of people. There's a, a lot of interim positions in our department right now. So I am interim director. There's interim community planning manager. We have an interim operations manager overlapping with Jeremy. We have an interim fiscal manager. Um, and, <laughs> and we're all doing great. We have an amazing team, <laughs> um, but we are just, we're down some key people. Um, so just ask for your grace as we go through the next few months. If we're a little late on following up on stuff, um, we're also down Tasha. Tasha is out for the time being. We're not sure when she's going to return. So, you know, if we're late with those minutes um, or, you know, not following up as quickly as we would like to know that it's, we're not doing it intentionally. That's all just within community planning. That's yeah. just community planning. Actually, it's the whole county. The whole county, but is it, relates to you. Yep, that is community wow. planning. So our growth management service team that carries really the heft of the docket, we have three and a half people right now instead of five. Um, and that, that hits us hard because every one of those people carries a very big workload. So anyway, you that's our staff don't. update. And then the other, just on the project side, um, I... There are two things I wanted to update you on. First, um, less restricted alternative community housing. Um, code update went to the board this morning for the initial briefing. There was an exact session. Um, the for um, Travis Burns, our prosecuting attorney, just bring everyone up to speed um, in terms of the legal parameters and any, any potential litigation that might come out of those code updates. So that was held. And then we were fortunate enough to have Commissioner's Casino and Halverson attend. And I didn't know if you wanted to share a little bit about the outcome of that meeting and the in the areas where the board is asking us to do follow up based on the planning commission suggestions. No, they didn't ask us any questions. Didn't provide us any opportunity to say anything. Mm -hmm. Didn't ask us anything about the letter that we submitted. Uh, gave us less than thirty minutes to discuss the uh, the LRA because they spent over thirty minutes talking to the attorney in an executive session about the LRA. An which I really didn't session. think was appropriate. And that's just my comment. Executive session sounds very questionable. Yeah. And that wasn't, that was not a staff's call. No, um, I know that. We're, we're, we're not making that. <laughs> um, I didn't think that. We did ask for a second work session on this issue. So yeah. I'm sure that some of us will attend to that one again. And we'll have opportunities to make public comment during their public hearing as well. But um, my point is, is I was not able to hear what the PAO said to the commissioners about the reasoning why it did not follow the uh, legislative guidance on the RCW. I would have liked to have heard that conversation so that I could have made a counter argument to it. We were not given that opportunity. Um, a lot of the feedback that we got for our initial thing was not legal interpretation. It was opinion. And I'm, I worry that that's what happened again. And there's no There's no transfer. No, no, public public no transportation, no, tr no uh, transparency. Transparency. Thank Sorry, you. I said transportation. Yeah. We just, but that's, yeah. that's, those that's are my comments about what happened three. this morning at nine o'clock for the rest of the planning commission to understand. So uh, if I could highlight two additional items, <laughs> um, the board did direct staff and the prosecuting attorney to look into um, the viability of creating a business license um along with some kind of inspection requirement that would go along I mean, that go would that would go with that an audit yeah they don't want to call audit yeah we asked audit and we got told one thing yeah i'm actually really glad that in the work session this morning got reframed and as soon as the word inspection was used our prosecuting attorney was like oh well that might be possible so so we are going to be looking into those two things as well as ensuring that whatever definition 
is in the code, both speaks to the RCWs as well as provides transparency and clarity. So those were the three things that for the yeah. board um, is probably gonna make movement on, like we're already working with Travis to develop um, some recommended um, yeah. policy update. Well, the the biggest, yeah, I mean, I was kind of stunned about the may versus must on uh, providing 24 hour, uh, not security, but 24 hour supervision, okay? Um, and the other one was uh, name change, whether or not you can add to the LRA language in the title. Right. Well, yeah, but I think Ashley just mentioned that they're they're looking at it putting it in a definition instead of in the title. Um, yeah, right now it's just the RCW definition, and I think the Planning Commission's comments about it not being really clear what it is without actually going and reading through a bunch of RCWs is a very valid one. And so I think Travis acknowledged that, and so we'll be working with him to figure out how to provide more clarity and transparency. Yeah, cool. So those are the, what I saw as positives, but I hear you. Well, no, <laughs> I can you're, share, the can the share that. The to hear us because I, I quite frankly did not agree with the executive session on this issue. And now this is taped, I hope they hear it. Uh, and I, as I oh, see them, <laughs> as I see them and talk to them, I will mention it to them individually. I, too. I think it would not hurt uh, anybody to go back through MRSC and look at uh, their guidelines for using executive session yeah. and consider how the county uses executive session. And I think that the county uses executive session excessively. Yeah. yeah. Um, transparency is right up there on our mission. Yeah. The, um, the other thing I wanted to provide an update on because it is relevant to a project that's going to be coming before you in the coming months. Um, there was a meeting held by the Urban Growth Management Subcommittee on Monday to consider updates to countywide planning policies. Now, remember, this is the policy framework that really guides how we um, work with our jurisdictional partners in a regional sense. Um, what was before the Urban Growth Management Subcommittee were updates to those policies related to tribal relations, um, as well as updates related to the new urban growth area swap tool that um, recent legislation was passed around. Um, so the UGM subcommittee did recommend um, both updating, um, I'll call them CWPPs for the tribal relation um, changes as well as changes um, that reflect the new RCWs for UGA swaps. So that policy framework will be there. Um, we, of course, have a project on our docket, the Bar Holdings one, um, which I know you've heard about from public comment that we are going to be hosting an open house for here in October. Um, we are intentionally holding our community open houses before we come to the Planning Commission because we want to make sure we hear from the community as early as possible and we give them an opportunity to share their feedback before we set foot in this room. So we will be sure to invite you to that open house and if we need to advertise it, we of course will. Um, and that way our briefings to the planning commission will reflect what we heard ahead of, you know, having a public hearing and whatnot. Um, so that's just an update on that project. That's probably the next non-comp plan one that's really gonna come. Um, when you were talking about countywide planning policies with the um, uh, urban growth management subcommittee, yeah. <laughs> did you guys, has anybody broached yet like an annexation takedown schedule yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I would encourage somebody to start thinking about that. Because, <laughs> you know, that's just a policy direction, not a policy. <laughs> uh, just one thing, uh, Ashley, uh, we, on our agendas in the previous to this, we had a Miriam's update on meetings. Meeting, uh, yes, thank you. Sorry about that. The, the, these are the little things that I are dropping off. Um, uh, all I know is that I'm going to Rainier Days on Saturday. So I don't know if any of you will be there. I'm looking at you. Woo! I'm excited. Um, I'll be there 10 to 4, um, Rainier Roundup. So, yes, let me see if there are any other um, specific events. I, I think we've had team members going out almost every weekend to events this summer. Yeah. Uh, 
I will probably be able to attend a portion of that. Cool. Be fun. Bill, you're fine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and Amelia, I'm not sure what which ones have I think you've been to events too. We were all at the fair. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I particularly like to attend the events in the district that I represent, so yeah. that's that's important. Seems like they were, they were probably missed it already, but tonight of Pioneer, Pioneer Days was. There is the uh, Yelm Farmers Market coming up that we're well, going to they have to the Yelm Market every weekend. <laughs> yeah, so we, that, I was like, I'm pretty sure you're in Yelm. Yeah, so. yeah. and. We the farmers markets we couldn't we didn't have enough people to go to everyone so what we tried to do is just make sure that we're getting out to at least one one of the farmers markets in each community. Maybe so just let me know work. when you can see it's that one. Okay. Like, literally, I can walk to it. Okay. Yeah, we can follow up with Miriam. No, thank you for reminding us because thanks. We have a calendar. Oh, it's right. been a fun summer. <laughs> thank you. Um, anything else? From staff updates. All right. I'm sure there's lots of stuff, but I'll be here. Talk about it for a minute. Um, the, the open house in October, you don't know when it's going to be yet, I assume. Um, no, we are finalizing finalizing the dates, and hopefully it's far enough out that we'll be able to get the word out. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you. We were waiting on the Urban Growth Management Subcommittee because we wanted to provide clarity for people attending that open house as to what the policy framework is going to be. That makes sense. All right. Um, with that, we'll move on to calendar with agenda items and attendance. Um, we've got two meetings scheduled and a tentative in October. We'll uh, open house. Um, we've got September 4th, work session 21, a housing element for Thurston 2045. Um, I know I will not be here at either of the September meetings. How are, oh, how are other people looking? Good. I think Joel said he would be able to make those. So. Be on Barry's pontoon boat. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's wishful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're invited, that's the, Kevin. Thank you. That's the that's fourth right. and the 18th we're looking at, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, Moving on um, to good of the order. Do we have anything for good of the order? Okay. The weekend, a full weekend of festivities. Yeah. Is it is it a good time, Mr. Fishburn? <laughs> that sounds like a resounding endorsement. <laughs> so there's a street dance on Friday night. There's a bluesgrass festival on Saturday and Sunday, and we always have our three block long parade on Saturday. And they got their new facility almost done, so. Yeah, the, the park has a brand new pickleball court and yeah. basketball court. Really looks nice. Nice. Almost looks like a park. Good deal. <laughs> All right, anything else on good of the order? All right, having no other business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Director Director Interim Director of